the meeting open. Um, with myself in the room today, I have Robin Newton, I have Vice Chair Kelly Armstrong, we have Andy Allen and also Alex Easton. And coming in via Starleaf, um, we have Sinead Innes and Mark Durkin. So you're all very welcome to today's meeting. I'll start with apologies as all members are present. Uh, well, almost all, the other, only other one is Fra. Sinead, is there an apology for Fra? Do you know? Yes, you're Thank, sure, yeah. Thank, you very, thank you very much. Okay, we'll move on to agenda item two, which is chairperson's business. Um, members have been provided with a note on the informal stakeholder event that was held on the 24th of November at page five. Can I then ask members, have they any comments and are they content then with the note and actions as drafted? Or are there any additional actions um, they, we, we want, that they want us to take forward on that? Are you happy enough with that? Yep, all agreed? Yeah, agreed. Okay then. Then also then, can I just say then, our next stakeholder event is proposed for Tuesday the 26th of January, from one until three in room 30. And the proposed topic for the event is social security and welfare reform mitigations. So, um, members content with that also? Yes. Yeah. Okay, then after today's meeting, then the clerks can send out a, an email then about that to get it in your diaries because I know it poses some problems mm -hmm. the Tuesday afternoon when it comes to question time. So, um, so that is Tuesday the 26th of January from 1 to 3. Okay, then if members are happy with that, then I'll move on um, and inform members that on Tuesday at the invitation of the Chair of the Economy Committee, uh, Dr. Keeva Archibald, I attended a joint meeting with the Chairs of the Committees for Economy health, justice and the executive office to discuss the impact of COVID-19 on students. The, topic under discuss the topics under discussion were the impact of COVID-19 on student welfare, well-being, uh, mental health and housing. Um, each committee in recent months has, of course, been investiga or investigating the issue within its own remit. At the meeting, it was agreed that the best way to further support the student body was across on these cross-cutting matters was to issue an agreed joint letter to the NI Executive. Um, the Committee for Economy has agreed to coordinate the response and draft the joint letter, and it's in your tabled papers today. Um, do members have any comments on the contact of the letter? Are they content with this joint letter? Content members? Yep. Yes, agreed. Okay, thank you. And then also just to, I just wanted to mention something. I attended a meeting yesterday with Action Mental Health to talk about uh, actually it was to talk about uh, issues to do with my own constituency in North Belfast and, and the role that they have in North Belfast in delivering services. But during that meeting um, they highlighted the issue again to do with the European Social Fund and the, the, the crossover with the, the Shared Prosperity Fund. So I just wanted to ask members um, if they would consider if they, what they, their thoughts around doing some sort of joined up meeting with other committees, should it be through myself as chair or other means, um, because if we know that this affects well, will affect all committees actually mm -hmm. um, to do with the, this funding issue. And we know we heard from, we have already heard in this committee um, from groups that have said that they're extremely worried um, come March 2022, um, not very far away, just around the corner, and there needs to be some preliminary planning put in place yeah. for that happening. Our I just sort of mentioned to it. Our members um, happy enough that we pursue that further, Kelly? Um, I'm I'm a bit concerned. We have a paper today from um, Nilga, yeah. um, which talks about this money. There's a lot of people interested in this money, but one of the things that we have to be very aware of is that the minister needs access to the money for supporting people, and you know to to help with all of those activities connected. So, to be honest, communities is the one that's going to be the biggest hit by that withdrawal of the SAUPB and, and the, those types of European uh, money. So I think it would be a good idea even to raise awareness amongst other committees that, that the money that is being, you know, going to come to Northern Ireland is replacing money that we're losing elsewhere. And there's there's already a call on that money. So I think you're right, uh, Chair, that would be very worthwhile. I mean, I know certainly from wearing the health hut for many years, that I mean, many of many of these organisations deliver those services within health. We heard that last week, actually, in our briefing as well. Um, so, would members be in agreement then that we start to make those connections with other committees and, and write to them yeah. um, that there needs to be some sort of joint up response to this? Members agreed. Um, Shania, do you want to come in? Yeah, thanks, Chair. No, just to obviously offer my, my support for that suggestion and just to make members aware, if they're not already, that um, TEO are bringing a report uh, to the Assembly, I think it's on the 14th, um, on, on that specific issue and how the, the uh, 
how this this funder or the lack of access to it is going to affect uh, local councils. So it's probably something for this committee and committee members to be to be mindful of um, in terms of our own uh, participation in that debate. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Sinead, for that. Okay. So are members in agreement then with that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right, then, I just want to move on then just to inform members that in line with Assembly recess, recess dates and statutory committees, um, they are planning to hold their first meeting at the week beginning the 11th of January 2021. So that will be our first week back, um, will be that week. Okay, now in saying that, if something urgent comes up and we need to meet before that, that will happen, um, absolutely. So members are happy enough or agreed with that as well? Okay, yes, agreed. Agreed. All right. We'll move on then to agenda item three, which is draft minutes. Um, you'll find the draft minutes of the 26th of November 2020 at page 12 of your packs. Can I ask our members content with those minutes as drafted? Agreed. 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 Okay, thank you. Then I'll move on to agenda item four, which is matters arising. Um, members have been provided at page 18 with a copy of the latest report of the examiner of statutory rules. The examiner draws attention to SR. 2020-62, the Social Fund for Funeral Expenses Payment, Coronavirus Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020. The Department has acknowledged that the regulations were laid in breach of the 21-day rule and states that this was due to its urgent response to the coronavirus pandemic. The examiner is content that the Department has, on this occasion, provided a, sta a satisfactory reason for the breach. Members content to note that or any comment? All content? content yeah. Okay. Then, can also then, um, four members have been provided at page 26 with a reply from the Minister for Finance in relation to tax relief for the Ulster Orchestra. Um, again, can I ask have members any comments on that? Or are they content to note that also? Content to note. Content? Yep. Okay. Then, can we move on to page 27, where there's a departmental reply in relation to major capital projects? Again, can I ask our members' content or any comments on the on page 27? Content. content yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Then, can I ask you then to turn to page 29? Mm. You'll find a departmental explanation as to why, in this instance, it is not practically possible to accommodate the request for an extension for the application to the musical instruments program. Um, I, I uh, had raised that myself here in committee and had sent that letter on. I, I am disappointed that that is the reply. Um, I, I do think that we that very much many of those individuals or groups uh, that 17 day turnaround was not enough. Um, I will accept it. I accept the reply from the department, but I think that is something we need to look at going forward into the future because many people um, or many people or groups when applying for that maybe don't have the capacity of some of the large, larger organisations when applying for funding. So I think that's something I would like to look at going forward as well. But I am content with the explanation as it is. Um, Kelly, do you want to comment? Yeah, um, I'm content with the explanation. I'm very concerned but that the Arts Council is planning this three-week um, it's required work to their ICT system. Um, I think I would like a wee bit more information about that hiatus, as they call it, because it's three weeks in the middle of one of the, the biggest outpourings of money from, from that organisation. And I appreciate their systems maybe letting them down, so they need to have those fixed. But that's three weeks. And I, I know that they say that, that the active funding programme, there isn't going to be a call for new funding during that period of time. Although, how do we know? You know, there could be, every day is a different day with funding um, for COVID. But my concern is that I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm getting calls day and daily from artists who are not receiving money. What impact does this have on the processing of existing claims for whatever funding um, is happening out there? Because three weeks out, is this a, is it changing now to a paper-based system? Um, what's happening? I would like to know from the Arts Council, and if possible, if we could write as a committee to them to say that we appreciate the fact that they need to do this. Why couldn't it happen over Christmas? Why does it have to happen now? What impact it will have on all of the different funding streams? Um, and if they're all working from home, as many people are, how, what is the impact? Does this mean a delay in the delivery of awards? Um, and it, it's just concerning, and I'm sure it's concerning for the Arts Council, in the middle of so many funding going out that they have this, they're faced with this, um, to think that anybody's computer system would go down 
or need to have this overhaul at this time is, is quite frightening. I think we will have the Arts Councillor in front of us in two weeks' time. Okay. Um, I'm getting signalled here from Sean from the back. So uh, we'll be able to ask those questions of them then. Now it's up to yourself. We can put that in writing um, to, forward to, to say that that is yeah. something that we want them to explain that would when they be come useful. along to the committee. Yeah, because yeah, no, if, that's fair if enough. they could provide a breakdown of all of the different funding streams that they're currently working through and what this has an impact on, yeah, because it, give them it, a heads up. Yeah, yeah. and I know they have been under to give you know fair play to them. They have been under immense yeah. pressure with the amount of funding applications yeah. and streams that have been gone out there. But I have been in the same position as yourself, Kelly. There have been a lot of complaints, so there have from organisations and individuals um, when it comes to that funding. So that's something that we need to drill down a bit further into. Members, any other comment on that musical instrument stuff, uh, uh, Robin? Yeah, can I? This isn't the first time, Chair. We had different department but we had the football situation which was similar small clubs uh, difficult health crisis situation admin haven't got the capacity uh, mm -hmm. uh, and indeed we're back to a similar situation I do note that the minister has said that the Arts Council must undertake an upgrade to its grant management system I'd like to know Chair what, why that is requested, okay. why the Minister is saying it must undertake an upgrade to its grant management system. The Minister has said that the work requires a three-week period. Mm. I'd like to be assured when they come that that work has been done. Yeah. And maybe, Chair, to the Minister, um, since and I don't know what the expenditure will be here and how much of the budget will have been up ta uh, taken up, but whether or not the minister would uh, intend in opening the scheme uh, again to, to allow those <coughs> groups that haven't made uh, grade the opportunity to, 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 to do so. Sure. I suppose that, I mean I know the minister had said in it that this is opened regularly and people should know about it and know how to fill the forms in and whatever else. But I mean my experience is with especially with smaller organisations, um, they they have AGMs every year and positions change every year. So it's not the same people that are completing these forms with the knowledge um, and the expertise. So um, this this changes regularly. So I think there are a few questions on that. Andy, did you want to come in? Yeah, Minister, uh, our <laughs> Chair, the chair. Minister, the <laughs> <I'll laughs> you there, Chair. Um, Just the, a minute. Just the a minute. Uh, members may have seen a press release in relation to a third round of the Individual Emergency Resilience Programme. Yeah. Um, and just to check that obviously this isn't going to be impacted by that, because if I recall yeah. rightly, it said application was open in around the 17th of December, and just to make sure that that's not going to be pushed to the right in any way. Yeah. Okay, well, they are all questions then for whenever um, we have the Arts Council in as well in front of us. Um, so that's okay. And mem members, anything else you want to comment on that or can I move on from that? Yeah, okay. <coughs> then I want to then just, uh, <coughs> members me. would go to their table papers. There's a reply from CO3 outlining their suggestions for the criteria for the uh, department's mm -hmm. COVID 19 fund. Again, can I ask members any comments? Are they content that we forward that through to the department for comment? <coughs> content? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. all content. Good stuff. All right, then we'll move on then to agenda item number five, which is a briefing by the Northern Irish Brewery and Independent Pub Association <coughs> on the Licensing and Registration of Clubs Amendment Bill. Um, members, just before the briefing starts in relation to the bill after last week's briefing by Assembly Research, the researchers are now produ producing additional short papers for us on the impact of extended hours on staff in the licensing trade, the impact of extended hours on the transport in infrastructure, taxis in particular, the impact of alcohol advertising and also local licensing forums in Scotland. And Eleanor Murphy will um, also attend the Institute of Public Health's webinar um, uh, that today. Um, or tomorrow, so it's today, um, entitled Alcohol Related Harms in Nightlife Settings on the Island of Ireland, and we'll report back to the committee. So, just to let them know that. Okay, members, um, you'll find your papers for this agenda item at page 32 of your meeting pack. And can I welcome then to our meeting William Main of Bull House Brewing Company, Pedro Donald, the owner of the Sunflower Public House, and Matthew Dick, the Boundary Brewing Cooperative. Um, so I think, William, we're going to start with yourself. Would that be right? Okay, William, you need to speak up a wee bit. We're finding it quite a wee bit difficult to hear you, so if you need to come closer. 
or you need to speak up, that would be good. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes, you're brilliant now. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, thanks very much for having us, firstly. I uh, really appreciate the chance to speak to you all today. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to do a quick uh, intro each. So, my name is William May, and I'm the owner of uh, Bullhouse Bruco in South Belfast. Uh, you can probably tell from our name that we started on a farm just outside Newton Ards, <laughs> and we're currently in the process of turning our original brewery into Northern Ireland's first dedicated wild beer facility. Um, we started in 2016 and it was just a hobby business at the start. Um, I left full-time employment at the end of 2017 to jump into the brewery head on. Uh, and to be completely truthful, it has been a struggle. Um, we've grown very slowly and we've looked on in envy as breweries of a similar size in Great Britain have grown rapidly by comparison. Um, the reason for this is that we can't access our local market, we can't sell directly to the public, and we can't sell draft beer to the vast majority of pubs, despite the public demand for our products. Um, we now employ three people, including myself, and uh, at the end of 2019, we were actually seriously considering moving our whole business across the water because of the restrictions in place here, but that would have meant uprooting three families. And when Stormy, fi final, or when Stormy finally got back together at the beginning of this year, we finally had some hope that things might change uh, through this bill. So over the past year, all the local breweries have got together to form the Northern Ireland Brewery and Independent Pub Association. And I'm here today as a brewer and a member of that association. We're completely voluntary. We're not paid lobby lobbyists and we don't wear swanky suits. We can't afford to wear swanky suits, unfortunately. And we welcome the draft bill, but we see it as a massive missed opportunity if breweries are not allowed to offer tap rooms and um, to sell our own beer as well as beer made with other breweries. Um, and the only way we currently can operate tap rooms is through borrowing occasional licenses from friendly publicans. Um, but that means we can essentially operate as a pub and we can sell spirits, we can sell wine. We're simply asking to be regulated and legislated for so that we can uh, continue to operate tap rooms without having to use occasional licenses. Okay. So I'll pass, pass that on to whoever wants to go next. Pedro, do you want to go next? I do, yes, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Pedro Donald. I've been working in the pub industry here in NI for nearly 37 years, starting part-time at a school, up to through management, and I now own two pubs in Belfast City Centre. Um, so I have, I have seen changes in legislation, licensing legislation over the years. Um, and and, and it, it is now time to, for another tweak and, and updating of them. And, and I fully support the small brewers who, who, who weren't a thing the last time the legislation was, was looked at. Um, so it is important that they are now included into the licensing system. Okay, thank you. Pedro, Matthew, have you anything you want to add? Uh, just a quick introduction. Guys, thank you so much for your time with all this so far. Um, I'm becoming addicted to watching your uh, sessions every Thursday um, <laughs> and seeing your support, even speaking to most of you uh, individually, seeing your support for our request uh, has been collapsed. Um, we're a, a small brewery in our East Belfast, um, just on the Lower Newton Arch Road. We've been going for about six years. Um, and in that six years, we've grown to become one of the, the bigger breweries in Northern Ireland. Um, we've got beer from America to China, all over the world. And um, we've had double digit growth every year. But unfortunately, the progress that we've made has been in spite of being in Northern Ireland um, and the laws that come with opening a brewery there. The, our sustainability, our profitability, um, our growth has all been limited really severely by the licensing laws. And as a result of that, over 80% of our beer has always gone abroad um, outside of NI, which means that there's lots of world-class beer from these local producers that, that leaves these shores because we don't have a route to market. Um, the breweries contribute massively in terms of taxation in proportion to their size. We employ disproportionately high in, in proportion to our size. And we're instructed to to brew, to package, to store, to wholesale, and to sell alcohol and to ship it around the world. We have proven track records um, of running one-off tap rooms and much larger events too. And all we're asking is to level the playing field a little bit and remove these restrictions of um, the samples and the tours, especially in a post-Brexit world. Okay, thanks, Matthew. 
Um, I'll just start off then with a, a few questions and then I'll open it up to members. So it's really um, just want to ask you, just to explain to, to us as a committee in detail how a tap room would operate and what, what the difference is between a tap room and a pub. And I suppose also asked, um, you mentioned in your uh, presentation as well, your, or your, your written report you sent us about collaborative products, selling collaborative products also. Um, so if you maybe could explain that also to me. Yeah, uh, I'll in, uh, then I'm, I'm cool for that one. The tap rooms uh, essentially are uh, people come to the brewery and try the products in the brewery uh, and they're not limited to a sample. Um, so we've seen, well, that's, that's the way they operate across the world. So if a tourist comes to the brewery and wants to come and have a few pints after they've had their, their visit to the brewery, they can do so. And the same with locals who want to know more about the brand and engage with the brand. They can come to the brewery and drink the brewery's products that are made in the brewery. Uh, and beer is a, a, a product that people can consume, you know, a couple of pints, and uh, it's not, you know, you're not consuming a couple of pints of, of spirits or uh, something higher strength. Um, so that's we're really just wanting to be able to sell our own products. The difference between a pub and a brewery is uh, breweries are generally on well. In industrial premises, uh, due to the nature of the manufacturing industry that we're in, um, we're not cozy environments. We don't have, uh, you know, uh, nice open fires and um, nice warm chairs to sit in. We're on industrial sites, and it's all about learning about the beer and building a brand and building a connection to the brewery with tourists and locals alike. Uh, so that's what I would see is the, the difference between a pub and a brewery and we think they can work uh, harmoniously together and they work across the world together um, it's a proven model and we think it's a model that should be followed. But then the issue of collaborative products, what, 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 does, what are collaborative products? Uh, so the brewery, and the brewery industry is a very uh, open industry and we're uh, all uh, quite close together so we, we generally uh, will brew beers together to try out different recipes and uh, on each other's uh, brewing equipment so we think that we uh, would like to be able to sell those products that we have made at other local breweries as well. Okay but it, it, it's not selling other breweries um, what they make it's, it's just the, those that you've collaborated in? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's that's okay. Um, then I suppose uh, Pedro, just want to ask you, as a, as a, as an owner of, of two bars, um, do you see this uh, any threat from tap rooms and the model that that uh, William and Matthew would like to say? Um, no, absolutely none whatsoever. Um, as William was saying there, it, it's a completely different animal. They're not. I, I don't know whether it, have you ever visited a brewery. Um, they do not even look like pubs, and in in a way, they they will help me to sell the beer. I sell a lot of craft beer and as much local as I can, um, and people who then who, who first visit the breweries, then the, the guys at the breweries are doing all the promotion for me, because they will then come to the pub and ask, "Oh, do you have Boundaries beer? Do you have the Bull House beer? The Cadas? All these local breweries." Um, so in no way, in absolutely no way, would it compete with me. In fact, it might even help. Okay, thanks, Pedro. And then I just want to ask one final question. Your paper also mentions um, the clause eight saying the occasional, the occasional license conditions, and that you had um, uh, issues with that. Could would you maybe explain to the committee that your issues around that? Well, we're not completely clear on what the clause 18 relates to. So the only way we can currently run tap rooms is by using occasional licenses. And from speaking to the department, we think that they might be trying to prevent us from doing so. Uh, so we would see the addition of that as potentially a regression and we could end up in a worse position after this bill has passed than we are in currently, um, which we don't think would be good uh, in any, for anybody. Um, so that's, that's what we're concerned about, so we're not completely clear on what, what the conditions might be. But uh, we feel that if, if we're not allowed to operate tap rooms, uh, or if we're not legislated to include tap rooms in this bill, we'd like to be able to continue operating our tap rooms using occasional licenses that we can get on it. 
Okay, and just one more final question made, um, before I open it up, because I don't want to be accused by the members of stealing all the questions, which I most certainly haven't done. I know there's many, many more that people <laughs> want to ask you. Um, just the issue then around the code of practice being legislated for, we've already heard in committee um, uh, that, 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 you know, against that, that what is in, what is in place at the minute works very well. Um, so you've also said that you would be against that uh, being legislated for. Again, reasons for that also? Well, we, I think we just don't think that private companies should be able to write legislation. Uh, that's what it appears that uh, that code of practice might end up becoming. So we think that uh, code of practices should be for industries themselves and, and not legislated for. Okay, right. Okay, Matthew or William, sorry, thank you. I'm going to open up to members and I have Mark Darkin first to come in. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Chair, and, and thanks to the guys for coming in and, and for the presentation. I know you said you didn't steal all of the questions, Chair. You, you just stole nearly all of mine, though. No, thanks for that. <laughs> Th thanks for that. No, I, I, I've met a few of the, the guys uh, previously and have heard from uh, brewers in my own uh, constituency, and, and I think the case and the arguments that they're putting forward, it's not even that much of an argument because... I don't hear that many people, or haven't heard anyone, certainly in committee, arguing against them. Uh, yet it, it, it just seems to make uh, so, so much sense. Just in terms of where you would like to go as an association, and if you outlined that around uh, the, the on sales and the off sales, it, it is cut and dried. I, I think you know there couldn't be any sort of grey areas around that, and I think that's a no-brainer and unlikely to cause any controversy. But in terms of the on-sales, have you any idea, sort of, as an association, as to where mm. you want to go in terms of opening hours? Do you know, I suppose different members might have different ideas, and that's, that's your members as well as ours, but how would you actually see this working in practice? Uh... Well, that's, at, the, at the minute, we can operate it with an occasional license and we can open the same hours as a pub. Um, so we would like to be able to open. We've, we've said in our, our uh, presentation, and I think on our uh, website as well, that we're happy with the closing time of 11 p.m. Um, we, we think if, if it's uh, overly restrictive, uh, I don't think anybody will apply for the license, um, and therefore it, it's pointless. Uh, you know, if it's completely... Uh, a lot less than what we could currently do with an occasional license. I think people will continue to use occasional licenses. So I think if we're going to regulate for breweries, we might as well make it something worthwhile to apply for. Uh, so I think that's why we'd, we'd be happy with 11 o'clock. And uh, I think Matthew had mentioned uh, possibly we, you know, we're we're in a, we're happy to link up with local pubs as well to to uh, allow people to leave the tap room and then and then go and try the beer in a local pub afterwards. And, and then in terms of the breweries or, or your premises as they are not being cosy environments, I think it was it, it was Matthew that says that there, as and hopefully when uh, you are allowed to bring customers on to uh, purchase and purchase and consume your products on site, there there might that might create a demand or even a need to make your premises more cosy. And customer friendly. Just wondering how you would see that evolving, because that's saying going to create more challenges and I suppose more opposition from the the, the pub sector. I should have declared an interest there, chair, as I do. My family do own a pub, although it's an independent pub, and we're entirely, uh, or I'm entirely supportive of what the guys are trying to do here. But I think it's important that we try, in order to get this through, to, to find a line of least resistance in ways, but, but, but not one that emasculates what the industry wants to do and what the industry needs to do. And it's not just for that industry. I think uh, Pedro's contribution is very telling. And, and I do think that we have a duty to kind of explore and encourage uh, relationships between the sectors, the independent brewers and the pub industry here to really uh, maximise benefits for both. Um, well, in relation to the, the comment about the pubs or the tap rooms not being cosy at the minute, uh, 
I guess I visited Matthew's tap room. Uh, I, we had our own tap rooms, and they are uh, they're sold out. They're, they're busy events. They're one in, one out, uh, and there's a huge public demand, even though they're not cosy. Um, so if we could get by without having uh, cosy environments and not having to invest in, in comfy seats, then we'd be happy to do that. But um, I do see your point, but I still feel that the range of products on offer are so limited to only your own beer that um, it's it's still not going to bring all the people out to, to go to it that want to visit a pub because you're... Uh, only going to get people that are really into their beer. You know, we're producing very niche beers that don't appeal to everybody. Um, so you're not going to get, you know, you always get, say, a group of six people wanting to head out for the night. Um, there's always going to be one or two people in that group that even if four of them love craft beer, two of them aren't going to want to drink the beers on offer, so they'll want to go somewhere else. So I think because it's such a niche uh, sector that we're operating in, um, I don't see any, any detriment, you know, to having maybe... You know, some some breweries might want to yeah uh, make their establishments a bit more comfortable if this legislation passes, but it's still going to be a very niche operation. Yeah, and then that's that's that particular scenario. I think that where the opportunity exists for pubs, to, you know, they actually uh, have contracts are used to be supplying them with your product. So if a, a, a group or a couple come along. The you I might manage to drag my, my wife along and I could have a couple of pints, but there'd have to be a promise of a G and T somewhere at the end of that. But you could direct me towards a, a, a pub uh, nearby, I suppose, that did stock your your stuff as well. I, I do think there's uh, great opportunities there, and, and and I think these are opportunities that we can't really afford to miss. And uh, th- therefore, I, I look forward to sort of working with committee members and yourselves as industry representatives as we go through the legislative process here. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I have Kelly, then of Robin, then of Sinead. Kelly. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Thank you, um, gentlemen, for your presentation. Um, I'm going to declare an interest because I have been up to one of the the breweries, um, not while this has been going on, it it was before, actually, I think just before we collapsed. But um, thank you very much for your presentation, gentlemen. I just want to tease out a wee bit more about what Mark was talking about. Um, Obviously, we don't have a producer's licence here in Northern Ireland as it currently stands, but there are other places that have producers' licences. So I just want to tease out what it is from those other places that you would love to see in Northern Ireland. And Mark had mentioned about opening ours. So are you looking for a producer's licence that would replicate what's going to happen with all the late licences um, that's proposed in the current draft legislation? Um, or how does that compare with the rest of the UK for producers' licences or the South? What's the what's the what's what are you looking for, or what are you trying to emulate towards? Um, I took that one, Willie. Yeah, good. Thanks, Matthew. Um, let me know my signal keeps cutting out. So if I die, just shout at me. Sorry. Um, thanks, Kelly. Um, on the opening hours, I'll, I'll go backwards on your questions, if that's okay. Yes. On the opening hour, I'm bringing in some of what Mark was asking there too. It is important that they're not too restricted. Because if they're too restrictive, we're just not incentivized then to invest uh, in the space, in the coziness, if the vernacular is today. Um, and the employment will be impacted and the value to our guests locally and internationally to the tourists will be seriously impacted. So they, they do go hand in hand. Um, we're, we're asking for 11 p.m. We think that's fair. Um, uh, and if you're asking about the licenses and the producer licenses specifically in other places in, in the South, in the Republic, um, the producer's license was brought about a couple of years ago with a lot of major changes to it, very last minute in their uh, system of legislation. And to date, only one brewery has taken that um, on trade license. Um, so it's tied in similarly to our current draft with uh, samples and with tours. So I think there's proof in the pudding there that, that what is in our current draft bill uh, is essentially a waste of time where we know no one will take it. Um, in GB, it's quite different. Obviously, the licensing is very different in GB. There's no surrender principle, for one. Um, but the, most of the licensing and the details around that are dictated more by the council, certainly in, in ours. 
Um, but, but, but breweries in GB are allowed to sell any and all alcohol, so they can sell spirits, wine, other people's beers. And that's not what we're asking for. We are only asking to sell our own product, plus or minus the collabs that we talked about earlier, um, and, and close at 11 p.m. We're quite, quite content with that. And would that be Monday to Sunday, or, or what days are you thinking? Yeah, Monday to yeah. Sunday. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the surrender principle there. There has been. Um, it has been. I've heard people talk about the potential for you guys to buy a, a pub license. Um, but you've mentioned the surrender principle there. Um, the surrender principle isn't something that that we can control because, to be honest, the court fees for a license are, you know, a few hundred pounds. But the surrender principle is on the basis that there's only a certain number of licenses allowed. And you have to surrender a, a license in order, you know, for someone else to take that up. Um, and there has been this almost like a bartering of licenses then that, that that happens on the market. But one of the things that confuses me is how could there possibly, how could you guys enter into that system when you're tied to a premises because of your production? I'm not sure. Is there anywhere else where that anybody that's tied to a, a premises? So if I just don't understand how the surrender principle could or would work with yourselves. Well, I can uh, quickly go through my experience of trying to get a license. So we uh, have just moved to South Belfast. Uh, we're just off Whitesher Road. So uh, from my understanding, there's essentially three options available to us if we were to try and get a license under the surrender principle. Um, option one would be to take over an existing pub um, which, and then move our production to that pub, which wouldn't work because uh, we'd have to move all the furniture out and then move our production uh, manufacturing equipment in uh, and it, would, it just would be unfeasible. Um, the second option, the, uh, possibly the easiest option would be to buy a pub in the local vicinity. Um, but unfortunately then you're limited to having to buy a pub, buy an existing pub that's trading in your area. Um, and they're few and far between in our uh, vicinity. And, the, it means the price is just dependent on, you know, we would have to buy somebody out and if they're uh, operating a successful business, why would they want to sell? Um, the third option is to try and move a license to buy a, a pub that's closed down somewhere else in Northern Ireland and try and move the license into our vicinity. The problem we face there is anybody that has a license in our area can then object to the license moving into our vicinity because under the current legislation, a 51A premises license is a 51A premises license. It doesn't matter if you're selling craft beer or if you're selling 24 packs of harp for 10 quid. Um, there's no distinction in law between what you're selling. So therefore, supermarkets are, are free to object because a lot of supermarkets are trading, operating under a 51A liquor license uh, and any other pub in the vicinity can object. So uh, it's really impossible for us to get a license. Um, the current value of a license has actually gone up during the pandemic. Um, because the, the uh, government incentives and, and uh, financial packages are still operating and um, nobody's selling pubs at the minute. So uh, it would be in the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds if we wanted to try and get a license under the current system, which is just untenable for our business. Okay. Um, which is something I was concerned about because, you know, if you want to sell a product whether you're in Armagh or outside Newton Ards or Fermanagh, um, it's tied to the locality. Um, you imagine asking Bush Mills to shift to Newry or something like that. It, it just doesn't make sense. Um, okay, I'm just trying to think. I, I, I understand where you're coming from and what you've asked for with um, the producer's license that you've mentioned in your briefing paper. The, the other one then you've mentioned about is the occasional licenses. And I just want to tease that out slightly. Um, so that means then, just to be absolutely clear, that the, the proposals contained within the paperwork or within the draft legislation would mean that you would not be able to use an occasional licence going forward. Is that right? Under We're that not idea? sure. Uh, it says that the, the court, uh, there would be conditions, would be able to put conditions on occasional licences, but we're not sure what those conditions would be. Yeah, so it, it, if, say for instance, a condition was in it that it w yeah, you couldn't bring in external providers. Yeah, that, that would close you so off. Right. Well, I'm in the, department, that's, uh, the, the purpose of that clause is to prevent breweries from operating tap rooms, 
using occasional licenses. Okay. Pedro, um, I'm very aware that you're with the Sunflower and you must be sick looking at political people because it seems to be um, somewhere that there's a lot of politics talked about over a few jars. I'm just wondering if there, if the occasional licences um, was to be changed, what impact does that have for your business? Well, we use occasional licences for mostly for festivals actually. Um, we use them, for anybody who doesn't understand the, the occasional licence system, um, a publican has a license, um, but other people can borrow it, for want of a better description, for a weekend, for an event, for a festival, possibly for a concert, for a top room. Um, as, as long as the, the, the alcohol side of it is, is supplementary to the event, to the concert or the festival. Um, so we use them a lot, and festivals particularly rely on them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if there's restrictions put on to that, then we'd have to know what the restrictions are to see how that would even impact pubs, never very mind well. breweries from being able to use them. No, that has been very useful, folks. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure we'll hear from you again as, as time moves on. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. I just want to ask a supplementary on one of Kelly's questions about the producer licences. Um, and I know it, I know over in the rest of the UK, it, it is very different to here and how councils um, have have more say as well. Um, but could you give us an idea of what those independent brewers over in mainland UK or Republic of Ireland or anywhere else um, are paying oh for a producer's licence, a ballpark figure? Well, it's, it's just the, the court fees again, so it's a few hundred pounds, um, but that's the same to open a pub. So the, the, uh, because the licensing system was deregulated essentially in 2003, uh, a premises license is a premises license. So breweries operate under a premises license, so there's no distinction in law uh, because there's no surrender principle. Uh, so if you open a pub in England, you just pay the court fees of a few hundred pounds and then you can open your pub. I mean, I understand that we need to have regulations, um, and that regulations are there for a reason. Um, but uh, in, again, in your experience in mainland UK or, or Republic of Ireland, um, what, what sort of what, what do you have to prove? You know, what's to stop anybody um, going for a producer's license and paying a few hundred pounds? Uh, you know, do you have to to, to show some proof um, of, of your company and how you how you perform or, or what you make? And uh, I'm not 100% sure on GB, but I think uh, you would have to prove that you're, you have to get a, a personal license first, so you'd have to do some courses, uh, and then you would have to buy the courts um, with the council, and, and they would approve based on your personal license. Um, but what we were planning with the producer's license here is to link it in in a similar fashion to the, um, the conference centre licences, where uh, you would have to prove that you're a bona fide brewery registered with HMRC and registered with your local council uh, as a food producer um, so that we're not just getting anybody uh, saying that they're an official brewery opening up a tap room. And so that's the checks and balances that we think are sufficient. The same as a conference centre, they have to uh, get approval from the, the tourist board or whatever their current uh, name is uh, before they can apply for a licence. Um, so we think. Uh, showing that we're bona fide breweries would help alleviate that problem. Grant, mm. thank you. Thanks for answering that, William. Um, I've got Robin, then Sinead. Uh, thank you, Chair. And just two very simple questions. Uh, first of all, uh, Northern Ireland Brewery and Independent Pub Association. Mm. Uh, how many pubs are part of the association? Uh, well, there's only a handful of pubs, unfortunately, that sell our, our products because the majority of them are Thai. So, uh, I'm not sure off the top of my head, but it's between between about six and ten pubs. Um, but we're a completely voluntary organisation. So, uh. okay. Can I just ask then uh, to whether it's Pedro or Matthew or William, whoever wants to ask, and thank you for coming along. If I was to go to a similar business to yourselves in England, Scotland, or Wales, what would be the difference between what exists in Northern Ireland? And in those other parts of the UK. Do you mean in relation to the taproom experience? Yes. Yes. Um, well, well, firstly, um, most of them would be considerably bigger than the Northern Irish breweries are because of their different routes to market. Um, 
so their employment would be more and the spaces and physical production sizes would be bigger. Um, apart from that, it varies quite widely. Um, there are some who uh, only sell their product uh, on site at their tap rooms or certainly only sell the majority of their beer through their tap rooms. But most um, have built their businesses around the tap rooms uh, on a model that they've really relied on the tap rooms at the beginning. And then as they've grown, become more robust and sustainable, they've been able to grow the volume of their production and begin to push further afield in the GB or even begin to export. Okay, thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Robin. Um, Sinead? Can you hear me, Chair? I can indeed, go ahead. Thank you, um, and thanks to the guys for coming in. And um, just want to say, first of all, I'm, I may represent South Downs. We've quite a number of um, of breweries in, in my neck of the woods uh, who are very excited about this um, forthcoming mm -hmm. legislation. Um, and you know, I, I think they're they have a huge potential to add, especially to our tourist product here in South Down, which we're, we're trying to grow. I just want to pick up on a point. Um, I think it was yourself, William. Um, and it's just to get some some clarity or maybe broaden the discussion on you mentioned about connecting with the brand and how tap rooms can help um, aid in that and I'm just wondering like has there been any sort of comparative study and how, how do you know that tap rooms would, would help in that or, or or how do you know that um, simply by only having a sampling uh, scenario at the end of a tour for example that that would adversely impact on um, connecting with the brand. I suppose we have to bear in mind as well that no sample size has been um, defined in this legislation yet. So, you know, we don't know that could be, you know, a small uh, mouthful, it could be a pint, it could be five pints because you have five different beers. So it's just bearing in mind that we don't actually know what, what the sample size will be. Uh, I will thanks for the question. I think it's a good point. There's, uh, because the kind of brewing industry has kicked off across the world in the last 20 years, it is quite a new, new thing for people. Um, it's probably best looking at case studies from across uh, other jurisdictions where they've changed the legislation and updated it. Um, so if you look at Georgia in the US, it was the, the last state, the 50th state to allow tap rooms. All the neighboring states. Uh, allowed tap rooms and the breweries were growing so much faster uh, even despite the fact that uh, breweries in Georgia were allowed to sell samples after a tour people were going to the neighbouring states and tourists were visiting the neighbours neighbouring states because they could go and sit there and, and have an afternoon uh, and a family friendly community friendly uh, hub rather than having to do a tour every time um, the same applied to New South Wales, so they did a pilot study, uh, they had very restrictive legislation getting back to the Second World War, uh, and New South Wales, uh, they already had an established wine industry where they had a cellar door where people could get a sample of wine after they completed a tour of the winery, but whenever breweries started popping up, they realised that that didn't work for breweries because people... You know, you want to sit and have a couple of pints. You don't want to just be restricted, and you don't want to have to go through a tour every time you go to the brewery. Um, so people might be restricted on time, or they might uh, just not want to have to do a tour every single time. So they introduced a pilot scheme in Markville, a, a suburb of uh, Sydney, and uh, breweries there have flourished um, since they introduced it, and it became statewide law then uh, in 2018 after the pilot study had been successful. So. That, those are, are places where they already had samples after a tour uh, as, as legislation and, and they had to create new legislation to allow tap rooms specifically. I think people want to connect with the brand and, and being restricted to a certain amount of beer or a certain, uh, you know, having to do a tour every time just uh, puts people off going to the, to the brewery in the first place. Well, that's, that's useful. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks, Sinead. Cool. Thank you. Um, Alex, you wanted to come in? Yeah, um, thanks for the presentation, and excuse my ignorance on this subject, but um, I was quite struck by the 99% of beers are being imported or, ex or imported into Northern Ireland. That's quite shocking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we need to do something about that, I think. Um, but um, you mentioned about some of the restrictions um, and you mentioned about the involvement of third parties or a huge expense to to those restrictions. I was wondering, could you explain 
the, 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 what this third party is and how, how that's restricting you, if that makes sense? Well, uh, as we've explained, or tried to explain, if we want to run a tap room at the minute, we have to borrow an occasional license off a pub. Um, so we have to be friendly with the uh, public in, in the first place to get the license, uh, or else, uh, you know. Uh, so small breweries that are just starting out, there's 30 breweries in Northern Ireland, about 15 are, are of a relatively big size and 15 are a lot smaller. Uh, for those breweries that are just starting out, it's impossible for them without the connections in the industry to, to approach a pub to um, borrow an occasional license. The same uh, happened when COVID struck. Um, we're obviously at the minute prevented from selling directly to the public. So uh, our whole route to market was shut off whenever uh, COVID struck, apart from uh, selling to off sales. But, uh, a lot of people were, were shopping online and some of the off licenses locally didn't have online sales set up. So uh, the only way for us to sell online was then to link up with an off license uh, that we had a relationship with and then they would obviously charge a commission for the use of their license. Um, so that's that's what we mean by the involvement of a third party and it's a logistical nightmare because the beer has to be dispatched from their premises and, and it's also a, a an increased cost that we see as a producer that uh, breweries across the water in England can sell to a consumer in Northern Ireland and not have any of those additional charges and uh, we have to face it. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you Alex. Um, no other member has indicated that they want to ask anything further. I do think Alex raised a good point there. Here, um, certainly within Northern Ireland, certainly within this, this assembly and this government, we bang on about shopping local, buying local, supporting local, um, uh, you know, and, and all of those industries in Northern Ireland to give us to give them the maximum support, but yet we import 99% um, of our beer into Northern Ireland. That that is pretty scandalous in itself. Never mind anything else. And I mean, I, your your uh, your evidence session today certainly puts a stamp down that you know we had questioned the department, you know, previously before getting the bill about how you as local breweries um, could possibly. Uh, operate with a license, and their advice was, well, they could buy a license. Um, but we know that that is highly unlikely that you would ever have the, the, the money to begin with to buy that whenever you're competing against large multinational supermarkets um, who certainly have much deeper pockets than you do. So um, I just want to say thank you for that. I want to ask all three of you again, is there anything that we haven't covered that you, you think that you need to add to this briefing? Um, because this briefing is recorded and it will be part of our um, our deliberations when we finish all our briefings. So it's just to ask you, is there anything else at all you want to add at this stage? No, I'm good. Thanks. You're all okay? That's good. Okay, well then, can I just thank you very much for coming along today mm -hmm. and for briefing us. Mm -hmm. And um, we, I'm sure we will be speaking to you in the future anyway. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, members, um, then are members happy at this stage if we just take a quick break to set up for our next uh, witness session? Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the North Okay, members, we're going to move on then to agenda item six, which is a briefing by the Northern Ireland Federation of Clubs on the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. Um, you'll find this agenda item at page 35 of your meeting pack. And can I then ask for Harry Beckinsdale um, to be brought into the spotlight, please? Uh, yeah. 
Harry, just before you start, uh, we only have you down as one person, you as the secretary, that are giving our briefing today. And because this is recorded and it is hand-sorted, um, I need you to give me the name of the person who is with you also. And will they be asking any questions? And will they be speaking? I, I actually, uh, Chair, I actually identified the department. It's, it's not a problem. It's not a problem, I Harry. All I need you to do is to give me the name. I just need the name of the person um, for the record, and just will they be speaking today as well? Yes, there's Mr. John Davis, the chairman of the Federation. Okay, so you're very welcome as well, John. Um, uh, Maura McKay, the, our solicitor. Okay, your solicitor's present. That is not normal, but okay. What is your solicitor's name, sorry? Uh, Maura McKay of Sheen Dixon Merrick. Okay. Um, oh, Maura, I see that Maura has come in sure. on the, she's in on the audience, so that's okay. All right, it's just, it's highly unusual that we don't have all of those names um, before a committee meeting. Um, but, uh, um, so, Harry, you yourself are down to brief us, so can I ask Harry if you can go ahead and brief the members? Yes, Chair, uh, 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 sure, I could just complete that. I, I have sent that information off twice. And, and one important person to uh, uh, be in attendance with us today is our accountant, Ron Shearer, who should be joining us. Um, but how, however, um, uh, I just want to thank you for uh, um, giving us the opportunity to address you today. Um, and very importantly, uh, it's, it's to do with the second reading um, and the omissions from the, the reading that uh, we found strange uh, in light of what's happening. Um, we were of the understanding that uh, in, in the previous uh, assembly that the 120 late licenses were reduced to 104. But we notice in this legislation that, that it has not changed uh, from the 85. Um, so there's that and a number of other things. Um, our solicitor had obviously researched the legislation and uh, found several anom anomalies that uh, she w wasn't quite happy with. So as a, our advisor, we, we were guided by her. Um, so if I could now hand over to our chairman, Chair, and uh, he could highlight some of the things before our, our solicitor engages. Okay, go ahead. Good morning, Madam Chairperson. <laughs> I, uh, am I right? Absolutely, uh, you go ahead. We're asking regarding areas that have not been considered in the review. And I'd like to bring your attention exactly uh, what, what and who we represent. First, there's approximately 550 clubs, of which 95 are sports clubs. There's over 300,000 members, adult, families and friends. The sports that we finance throughout the province is golf, rugby, hockey, cricket, bowls, GA, football, tennis, sailing and yachting, snooker, darts, pool, ladies football. Also, we have academies. Virtually all sports now have, have, are accommodating academies for our young boys and girls. And if you go at the weekends and in the summer nights, you see thousands of young boys and girls pursuing different types of sports. All those academies have to be regulated with coaches and all the coaches must be registered with the local councils so as to prevent pedophiles and other people who have an, uh, a, 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 a dubious background. And all those coaches all have to be paid by the club. Throughout the province, to cover all these sports, there's possibly up to 400 sports grounds province-wide. And the cost of maintaining those sports grounds and also the pavilions and the changing rooms that goes with them is, is, is a vast amount of money, as you can expect. As you are well aware, sport in Northern Ireland punches way above its weight, as you can see regular on TV. And the most, the most latest episode was our ladies football team qualifying possibly for the latest, the latest stages of the ladies European football, which we all must congratulate them. The clubs also have thousands of bar staff, waiter staff, door staff, cleaning staff, and thousands of volunteers are required to maintain our clubs and our sporting ethos province-wide at great cost. The running cost of sports grounds and pavilions and to include is electricity is in the region of 13,000 
club insurances to include 20,000. The wages waiters is again a vast sum of money. Rates is in the region of 18,500. General repairs and overall cost to the run clubs is massive. We are disappointed and shocked that this was not con considered when the review was taking place. <coughs> we were never consulted, nor ever consulted now or ever. Uh, and we want all these points brought to your attention. Again, we see and hear a lot of sports tourism. Sport tourism would not exist in Northern Ireland if you had any sports clubs to supply all the talented people, boys and girls and men and women to perform in different sporting leagues and go on to represent their countries at, 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 at the international level, which we're all proud of and we can see at our, uh, regularly. Also, the governments and councils perform and do their best to have health policies. There's no better place in Northern Ireland where we get thousands and thousands, and thousands of boys and girls, men and women, pursuing their sports, which indeed is, 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 uh, is our health policy from our sports club's point of view. That's my intro, Madam Chairman. Uh, Chair, um, it's hi, back and see again. Uh, our hi. solicitor is out of the country at the moment, and she's just confirmed to me that uh, the signal isn't sufficient for her to connect. However, I, I have her submission in front of me, and she's asked me to confirm that you'd like to receive that submission. We have received, we have received the submission, Harry. Um, right. I have it here in front of me. I would assume that is where it has come from. If she had yeah. sent it through, then Harry, that is what we have. Um, it talks about the accounting regulations. It talks about the hours of use That's of right. clubs for minors, police rights of right. entry. It talks about various things. Is that what she's talking about, yeah. Harry? That's right. And, and basically what she's asking, uh, Chair, is the rationale behind the, the difference in the legislation applied to clubs as against that applied to the rest of the hospitality industry. Um, there, there doesn't seem to be you know, a good reason for it. Since we've moved forward substantially from the early years, uh, so that's what she's making re reference to, that and a number of other things. Um, like for instance, the licensing order you'll see from the submission there, which is allowing the rest of the uh, hospitality industry 365 days a year, and the current bill consideration will permit them to open even later until 2 a.m. on 104 days per year and until 1 a.m. in the remaining 261. Um, particularly highlighted in the recent, uh, this pandemic that we're, we're all engaged in, I mean, registered clubs are more able to, um, to trace and track uh, because of the signing in requirement. Um, so you, you're left to wonder you know, exactly why the legislation is so unbalanced. Uh, and thus, this is why uh, she's asked for what is the rationale behind this, uh, since we are in the 21st century now, and the clubs are more able to self-regulate than the rest of the hospitality industry. Um, she moves on to uh, look at other things like PSNI rights of entry, and we don't object uh, in any way to the PSNI having rights of entry, always providing it's in the pursuance of crime, and that is applied to other uh, facets of the hospitality industry and other business sectors where they just cannot walk in off the street for no reason and ask to speak to committee men, see books, etc., etc. Um, th we think that is greatly unfair. And recently in the pandemic, it, it raised its head when we, um, and we don't wish to be seen as criticising the PSNI, but there are certain uh, elements where an officer can go in and start to interpret the legislation. And of course, in its present form, uh, the, the uh, regulations pertaining to clubs enables them to do that. Uh, and we have had uh, isolated instances, I would add, where uh, and officers went in, questioned what constituted a main meal. When that morning, the club in question actually phoned the council uh, to confirm that, uh, but yet when the PSNA walked in, they didn't agree with it. Uh, other instances were a sub substantial number of officers visited premises to um, tell members that they couldn't sit 
uh, for a certain time after having a meal and that a certain amount had to be charged for the meal. Both of those uh, things are completely erroneous. Um, so, but that is probably an isolated incident, but the legislation and the availability of the PSNI to walk into club premises is there to allow them to do that. And such is not the case with other sectors. Um, so that, that's where we are with that. With regard to the sport, the, the chairman quite rightly underlined uh, the importance of clubs. But you don't have the support structure here. The population doesn't allow for it. So the social aspect of a, a registered club provides the finance to support the sport. And most clubs in Northern Ireland are affiliated to one sport or another. It also brings people together. It breaks down religious barriers. And I can use a prime example. My own granddaughter, age 11, and her friend, age 11, uh, she's from Uri. She plays GAA. They are both um, playing at Linfield. They're both at the IFA Advanced at Jordanstown. And they have both been signed up to the Arsenal Academy. That all came from youth football, which was financed by the registered club sector. And uh, Professor Sander, the late Professor Sander, when he was chair of Sport and I, confirmed that uh, from a survey in 2000, um, an independent survey by Sport and I, they were able to establish that registered clubs in Northern Ireland contributed £500,000 per day uh, to sport in Northern Ireland. Um, the, the, the sector contributed at that time around £4 million a year to charitable and good causes and around £25 million to under, underpin sport. And those statistics were taken from a 70% return and were provided to us by NICFA, the Northern Ireland Council for Voluntary Action. So all those things add up to show the contribution that registered clubs make to the social fabric of Northern Ireland. And I think that those things have to be taken, taken into consideration. Um, at this stage, is, uh, uh, can I confirm if our accountant is on, on the line with us? Uh, uh, he appears not to be. Yes, no, I am. You are, Lawrence. Okay. Um, I'd like to introduce Lawrence in to um, make a contribution. In regard to the unfairness of the accounts regulations, um, which are greatly imbalanced uh, in respect to the size of respective clubs. So okay, Lawrence Harry, Shearer, just before uh, Lawrence comes in, so it's Lawrence Shearer, just for yeah. the record, it's Lawrence Shearer and he is the accountant for the organisation, just for that to be put on the record. Um, that Lawrence, is exactly right. Lawrence, just that is right, Shearer. Sure. Yeah. Lawrence, just before um, I bring you in, um, there are many things that do not fall under the scope of this bill, and that's not what we're here to discuss um, as part of the evidence gathering. But just to say to you, last week we had uh, a session from the department to do with the, the very issue of accounts. I don't know if you managed to listen to that briefing that we had from the department last week, because they were bringing um, through um, some, I can't remember whether, whether it was a subordinate legislation or with something anyway, last week. And I had asked, or a few weeks ago, and I had asked them to go away and come back again to give us a briefing because it had been highlighted to me the issues to do with the accounting especially for smaller clubs and the, the amount of pressure that put those smaller clubs under so they have assured me that the new regulations that will be coming in which is not nothing to do with this bill at all um, will indeed um, are, are there to support the smaller clubs um, so I can certainly get that information um, shared with yourselves um, that we from our briefing last week if that's helpful but um, just before I just wanted to say that before you you start Lawrence so if you want to go ahead if there's any other comments you want to make yes thank you lady chairperson um, yes I was really uh, asked as the Northern Ireland Federation of Clubs accountant to uh, clarify uh, the current situation and obviously welcome and look forward to any revisions that may take place um, currently, the uh, NI clubs, uh, regardless of size or complexity, are governed by an extremely rigid framework within the Registration of Clubs Accounts Regulations 1997, which, believe it or not, became operational some 23 years ago. 
Um, all club financial statements are stat subject to a statutory audit and must be presented in strict pro forma format, regardless of whether an income or expenditure category is relevant to the individual club. There is currently no distinction allowed regardless of the size of the club's income and or net assets. Um, the analogy uh, to, to sort of promote uh, much needed revisions to these regulations would be that within the UK companies legislation sector, um, a micro entity company would be a company with sales of 632,000 or less, and a small company would be regarded as having sales of, of up to 10.2 million pounds per annum, or a balance sheet total of 5 million. And um, so uh, the clubs fall under a regulated sector, um, and a similar sector to that would be um, NI charities. Um, and then with the, the Section 6 and 5 of the Charities Act, NI 2008, um, a charity would be regarded as small if its income fell below 500,000, and regarded as large if it fell uh, between 500,000 and a million. Um, so what we're really wanting to uh, request for consideration would be that the regulations uh, need updated and made fit for purpose um, and to remove some of the onerous um, red tape uh, that is in within the body of the regulations that committee people uh, in, involved with the clubs who for the most case are volunteers um, are asked to comply through all these very onerous regulations. Um, so definitely a consideration could be given to uh, remove uh, the need for statutory order for certain sizes of clubs and the bigger clubs that if there was a statutory order still required that um, the regulations could perhaps be relaxed on the paperwork etc required. So I'll now hand you back to um, Chairman. Thank you, thank you, Lawrence, for that. Um, what I will, there's a little bit of feedback coming through from I don't know which of your your um, microphone feeds. Um, just uh, Lawrence, I am going to give get that information that we got last week in committee. Um, I'm going to ask that it be sent forwarded to yourself. And if you find that um, it is not going to be helpful or it doesn't go far enough or whatever the case might be, could I ask you then to uh, get back in contact then with the committee directly, Lawrence, around that Certainly. issue? Yes, Okay. Certainly. And, and thank you for that. Um, I'm going to start, um, if my, now we're going to go into our question and answer session um, to, um, to you. To, and I just wanted to start off by saying I, I absolutely get um, that, that clubs... Um, especially those sport clubs, but clubs in general are a vital part of, of many communities here in Northern Ireland. And I understand the, your, your reasoning um, when you say that clubs should be treated on the same footing um, as, as, the, as, the, uh, as bars when it comes to many of the issues within this bill. Um, but I just want to ask you on um, just one particular issue, and that is the issue to do with the, the minors on club premises. And the dates around that. Um, can you then just give us some more, a bit more explanation as to why you would want that to see, see a longer period of time? Well, well sir, um, funny enough, uh, one of the first people to raise that with me was Roger Bell of Cow Folks Cricket Club. I noticed just last night he's been elected president of the Northern Ireland Cricket Union, um, and he raised to me multiple times um, of the, the months in which. Um, they are permitted to have extended hours, are too short. And they, they would require uh, May to September, as opposed to June to the end of August. Uh, and I'm quite sure that the, the entire spectrum of sport would require much longer than uh, a couple of months to enable the academies to train. And, and being my local club, I know myself, the young people that are engaging from local schools in cricket and so forth, and certainly two months would not be sufficient for them um, to uh, run their academies. And I'm quite sure that the other sports, such as GAA and soccer, are, are similarly affected. Um, and of course, that's added to by the current pandemic. 
So the extended months would be uh, certainly more desirable, and I'm quite sure that, that that message would come from other sporting bodies as well. Um, so uh, that, it is vitally, vitally important that those months are extended to facilitate those academies. Um, and uh, it's widely recognised that sport is so important, and Northern Ireland punches well above its weight in all facets of sport. Um, so perhaps you'd like to add something to that, John? Well, I think I'll, I'll endorse what you've actually said. But I'd like to say, when you go around the coastlines of Northern Ireland and you see the yacht and sail clubs, and you go around the golf clubs, in particular in the summer months and at night times, you see the, the hundreds, if not thousands, of young boys and girls out pursuing these sports and getting coached to the attain higher status of perfection and hopefully to represent the club and represent the, 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 their particular sport and go on to probably higher accolades and maybe represent their countries. So there's no doubt that the, the, the two or three months that they've allocated for what we look upon as the summer months, we think uh, it's a bit derisory and we think it should go from probably April to September. Okay. Um, and John, thanks for that as well. I just want then to move on and ask you just something else. I, I understand the rationale for that and that has been brought up in committee um, before, before about extending that time period. Um, the issue of the late nights, um, you had mentioned, I think Harry, you had mentioned it earlier in your presentation, um, that again, um, that you, you didn't feel that the, the late nights were, were, were enough. And I know certainly with many clubs, they do a heck of a lot of work when it comes to fundraising and events that they hold regularly within those clubs. Um, so just, Harry, just again, if you could just, I know you'd mentioned it earlier, but just um, how you, what, what you think that the, the late nights should be. Well, we, we, we're requesting three late, three late hours per week. We're requesting, another one, we, we, we requested 104 away back in 2000. That may have been relevant in 2000, but we're now at 220. And there's no doubt, whatever, whatever, whatever regulations and licensing laws is changing, it's going to probably be for the next 15, 20 years put in place. So, although we made the case in 2000, and probably in fact, back as far as 1966, we feel that if, if we have to maintain the sporting basis that we've already iterated here in the record uh, at length, we think the three eight bars to, keep the, to take into consideration the charity fundraising that, that takes place in clubs, when you consider uh, late nights for the likes of snooker, darts, pool, indoor, indoor uh, bowls, and the winter nights which takes place inside, we feel that the, the 11 o'clock closing is very minimal, and clubs are getting brought into the street with the, the present regime of 11 o'clock closing. But when, when we look at the legislation, in relationship to what has been considered, it is start with what we're requesting. I mean, what we're requesting is, you could actually actually maybe say, it's a bit embarrassing when you compare it with what's been considered for other sections of the hospitality trade. How people can come up and say that the club sector and what it stands for and all the communities who have benefited from it, I just can't see the rationale behind why they've allocated not one minute, not one hour, I, I, I can give you some evidence of this, but in, in a former life as a musician, and I spent my latter days of my long career in music playing in social clubs, and, and I've also got a, a heavy connection with the charity sector, and I can confirm, um, and absolutely uh, it's unquestionable, that, for instance, Paul Sweeney, when he was the regional manager of Macmillan here, was, was able to confirm to me uh, in an unsolicited comment that the majority of his target each year for Macmillan was raised through the network of registered clubs. And he made quite openly to me. Uh, and not only that, I mean, I played at several events where they were specifically run to um, support various organizations, whether it be Fleming Fruit and School, uh, Mitchell House, uh, Marie Curie, all these charities benefited greatly. So much so that each year the, the Federation was nominated at the NICFA Awards to the point where we suggested that they stop nominating us and afford the recognition 
to the sector members of our association. So, I mean, it's unquestionable. The amount of money was, was uh, confirmed in that earlier survey in 2020. And whilst it might have been impacted uh, in the financial crisis of 2008 and the current pandemic, I'm quite sure that the amount of money is still valuable uh, and it's appreciable. Um, so that is one important um, aspect um, of the need for uh, the extensions. And okay. it's, I would emphasize this is not um, a campaign to increase the availability of alcohol. Far, far from it. There's much more attached to a registered club than that. It's not just a bar. Um, it provides much more. And once we recognize the, the um, availability of uh, a bar manager or a hotel owner to run their business commercially, that's exactly what they're there for. And if I was managing or own one of them, I would be doing exactly the same. But there's much more attached to a registered club which has been recognised since inception that it's an extension of a man's home. And, and many of them were established in the days when they didn't have homes sufficient to have things like snooker tables, etc. And they were attached to factories and they enabled the, the working man to have an activity outside of work. And he didn't necessarily have to go to a bar, but he could go to his, his, his member club. Um, and I, I would add also that clubs are very wide and in their range. It goes from golf clubs, all kinds of clubs, uh, whether it be the reform club, whether it be golf clubs, whether it be a working man's club. The legislation is all embracing and we think it's, it's very unfair the disparity between that sector and the overall hospitality sector. Okay, uh, so thank you. Okay, thanks, Harry. I'm going to move on here because I have a couple of members who want to ask a question of Robin and then of Kelly. So go ahead, Robin. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I welcome Harry and John and Lawrence uh, to, to the meeting. Thank them for coming along. Could I just uh, spend a few minutes talking maybe to Lawrence about the accounting regulations? And uh, I'm conscious that we have uh, just a few paragraphs here from, from you, Lawrence, on it. Uh, I just wonder if, if uh, and the chair has already indicated that she will send information on to you. Can I just ask you, Lawrence, if you would, and whilst you were speaking, the line wasn't great, Lawrence, but could I ask you if you would just outline exactly what you think at this stage that would meet the requirements of the clubs uh, and yet at the same time meet the taxation and accounting regulations? Yes, um, well, a, a similar uh, sort of area uh, to the club sector, which is a regulated sector, um, would be the Northern Ireland charity sector. Um, and the, the, within the charity sector, there, there is uh, descriptions and definitions as regards what would be uh, regarded as a small charity what would be regarded as a medium-sized charity and what would be regarded as a large charity. Um, the charity charities are subject to statutory audit, um, but not all charities. And the, the, the need for a statutory audit is directly dictated to by the size of the charity's income in any one year. And specifically, uh, a charity would be regarded within Northern Ireland as a large charity if it had income in excess of £500,000 and therefore subject to a full statutory audit. So possibly that could be an outline framework with which to look at re re revising the Registration of Clubs Accounts regulations because at present um, the regulations have no distinction whatsoever on the size and complexity of a club. Okay, uh, so your, your thinking really is that it should be limited to the turnover of, of, of the organisation as opposed to something like the membership of the organisation or, or any other factors? Yes, well, well usually uh, in reality the, not, the size of the membership usually does uh, correlate along with the size of the turnover. 
um, of the club because obviously the more members that the club would have, uh, then it would, it, would, it would seem reasonable that the sales uh, stroke turnover income levels from that club would be larger. So yes, there could be you know inclusion of size of members of the club. Uh, and just in your opinion, if if this matter is not addressed in the new legislation, what are the implications for the? And references already been made by I think Harry or John about sailing clubs and football clubs and so on. What would be the implications for that? Well, um, the, the regulations are, are very uh, prescriptive and onerous. And uh, most of the clubs uh, throughout Northern Ireland would be have committees that are, 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 are led by volunteering members uh, from the club. And a lot of membership is, uh, and volunteers would be put off becoming uh, people of responsibility within the club because of the onerous compliance with the regulations, as they have the perception and fear that somehow they could be held responsible if they weren't compliant with the current regulations as they stand. So it, the, the implications for a club would be that they may find it hard to appoint uh, on a volunteer basis uh, members to the committee who would run the day-to-day -day, uh, organisation of the club and take responsibility for proper recognition and recording of its income and expenditure. Okay. As, it, as it stands at the moment, as it stands at the minute, Lawrence, is someone who signs up to be a member and is signing the accounts of the club, I presume that person is held legally responsible. Would that be the case? Um, I would uh, refer you to John, uh, the chairman of the Federation, but in my opinion, yes, uh, they would be legally responsible for the income and expenditure and responsible legally to the, the main body of members of the club for the assets and liabilities that the club accrues. And therefore, you know, it is very onerous that the, 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 the committee person who is also a member um, feels that they have a responsibility to uh, the law and also the membership of the club in question. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. I'm just trying. We have terrible feedback again coming from someone's uh, uh, feed there. Um, I'm just looking, I know you've mentioned here about Article 40, I'm just trying to find it in the bill to see where it is within the bill. This. Sorry, Chair, just maybe as, as you're looking for that, maybe could, <clears throat> through you, could we ask Lawrence maybe to send uh, a submission in, yeah. in a bit more detail than what we have within Yeah, the that, that would be helpful because I'm trying to find where, on, where in the bill that... Um, that re where it relates to Article 40, but that's okay. Lawrence, if you could send that in, that would be good. Um, have, you, okay. have you finished there uh, for the time being? Yeah, can I make, uh, just, 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 make a comment regarding the next regulation say? Yes, to go ahead, absolutely. Well, way back in 2000, we, um, we, we solicited to the field officers of the White and Trice, one of the United Kingdom's <clears> major <throat> accountancy bodies. Uh, and they put a paper together and submitted it to the then committee. I'd just like to read a couple of the excerpts from it. We have, since the public case first draft 1996, closely followed the development and fashioning of the regulations and have, together with many professional firms, challenged many of the provisions on the basis of their unnecessarily onerous and practical, and practical costly and discriminatory nature, a conclusion which was wholly influenced by our extensive knowledge and experience of clubs and the club industry as a whole. The regulations that came into force in September 1997 do not reflect many of the earlier suggestions and recommendations made by this firm. But the fact remains, no other companies or businesses in Northern Ireland are subject to such, such wide-ranging and far-reaching statutory complaints constraints. 
The requirement for every voucher, receipt, report, etc. prepared by the club to carry the name and signature of the preparer is already imposing a significant burden and the benefit of which has yet to be revealed or identified by the department and this is the main part. This is certainly not a requirement of even the most rigorous control systems of any regulated bodies such as banks and other financial institutions. Now that's damning and that in my opinion gives the, the, the true impression that the, the, the present accounts regulations are very draconian in the makeup of them and very onerous and virtually unless you have the 12 disciples as a committee you find it very difficult to comply, to comply 100%. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Robin, you yes. that? Okay, I have Kelly and then I have Alex. So, Kelly, go ahead. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, all I would say is be careful what you wish for. Having worked for 20 years in the community and voluntary sector and under the, um, the Charity Commission's requirements, um, that doesn't always mean that you don't have to produce audited accounts. Um, often your funders um, will require you to provide them, whether or not Companies House or the Charity Commission requires them. Um, what I would also say is every single director or trustee in a charity is individually, legally responsible for that organisation. So it's, it's not necessarily going to be, the, the grass isn't always greener from the charity side. Um, but I just wanted to ask you, going back to um, the legislation with regards to the liquor licensing, um, you have talked about the amount of time that minors can be within the licensed premises. And John, I appreciate you've said that there's a lot of young people. I'm going to play devil's advocate here because we have to consider the legislation and if there's any amendments to it. And when you talked about young people going along to different sports clubs and certainly taking training and so on, um, I don't see how that links in with the licensed premises. Now, they will be certainly on the grounds, but how are those young people then linked to the licensed premises? Because surely they would be out in sports grounds. Or I'm just trying to think, if the officials come back to us and say, but this has nothing to do with the actual sport itself... I know you can turn around and say, but actually snooker and darts is, is within the building. But I'm just thinking about that licensed premises. If, if, you know, if we have children getting trained, which they absolutely should do, give us an answer that we can give back to the, the officials to say why it's important that that changes. Yes. Right, uh, well, you know, thank you for inviting me to, to reply to that. Uh, the problem is when they come off, let, let's take, for instance, you can take golf, you can take football. Um, and uh, I, I was engaged with Billy Derek Connors at one time and developed the youth football team there. Um, when we had a prize giving, I had to have the prize giving in my own home because the, the legislation didn't uh, afford me the availability of the club rooms. So that's how ridiculous. That's an extreme situation. I, I, another example was... Um, we can go down to um, down Patrick Creek Cricket Club, and there was an event there um, for scrambling, and the event for young people was actually sponsored by the PSNI. The night they were given the prize given, the PSNI locally went in and told them they had to shut because the young people shouldn't be on the premises. The event was actually sponsored by them. This is not about young people having access to alcohol. It's, it's young people being allowed to avail of the sports club premises in the company of an adult, a parent, uh, a coach, but it's not about them having access to the bar facility. It's them having access to the changing rooms and to be able to come into the club premises and wait until um, the adult or the coach is leaving. Now, once again, I can give you an example where one day, uh, one night, sorry, down at Ballyclare, um, I had to have young people standing outside the club rooms, unable to come in. Uh, and it was a winter's night, and I actually was, was driving the home, but they could not come into the club rooms. I and mean, how ridiculous is that? I mean, we're all sensible people. In my childhood, I was quite used to going across the England with my parents and you, uh, you, you were able to see good practice um, where it wasn't all about people taking excess alcohol and we need to take the, the, the attachment of alcohol out of it. It's not about that. It's about sport. It's about a facility. 
Uh, and uh, we, we don't need to be referring to alcohol all the time or putting a sporting club and alcohol together. It's not about that. It's about the availability of the sports club premises for the use of those young people. But I would add, in the company of an adult, a coach or a parent. And, and that's what it's about. And Madam Chairman, sorry, I endorse completely what Harry is saying here, but there is other events that take place inside the club. There's, there's, there's anniversaries, there's deaths, births, uh, wedding parties, birthday parties, and, and for by trying to raise funds for, for the community at, at, at large, where on a lot of occasions it's important that members and their children and family be all in the tent while that, those events are taking place. Now, that is not on, on every night and every day that takes place, but it's, it's only but right that uh, they should have that facility, the sports club and clubs should have that facility. Can I just ask you on that, um, one of the things, when I was looking at the legislation, obviously they have within the, the underage functions, so the sports club itself can hold an underage function, um, and children. what they have currently in this draft proposal is that under 18s can be at the underage function as long as all the taps and stuff are turned off so they can't get access to alcohol. But just as you've mentioned there, John, private functions. Now, this, this melts my head completely. So a private function could be a birthday party, you're absolutely right. But it states in the current legislation um, under 28.3a that, that there has to be a main meal provided. Now, I don't know what birthday party comprises of a main meal. You know, that could be, you know, a tip top and a packet of crisps. Um, it, that, I just wonder in the private functions, constantly referring back to a meal, um, is that actually realistic when it comes to some of the functions that you have going on, private functions that go on in your clubs? I'm not aware of, of that part of the club's order. I'm not. Uh, the no, this order, is the liquor licensing. This is about the liquor licensing. So it says about... Yeah. Well, we don't have a liquor licence. We have a registration. If you're looking at the, the, the bars, the, the registration, the clubs are allowed, sports clubs are allowed children on their site up to 9 o'clock. And the, the restrictions that you're mentioning here do not exist in the club's order. This is part of the new draft legislation. So no, what the new draft legislation is going to be just going to be enhanced, allowing children to be on sports premises in the, in the company of their adults, parents, or coaches, uh, as long as they're not standing or sitting at the bar. Uh, that's the club's registration. Uh, and it's going from 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock, I'm, I'm aware of, up to 10 o'clock. Yes. Now, that's sports clubs. We are aware that for the first time ever, that the bars won't be allowed families and children to be on bar, bar premises for the first time ever. But that's liquor license, and we don't come under liquor licensing. We come under club's order, the 1996 club's order. Well, this is proposing that young persons prohibited from bars mentions about the provision of a meal. But I'm just checking with you under that new proposed legislation, the private functions one, does the male yeah. element fit in with the type of private functions you have in your clubs? Uh, it, it depends what, what is categorised as a male meal. I mean, we've heard the ridiculous news in days past, and I've got a scotch egg. You know, it, it's down to what one interprets, it, uh, yeah. interprets as a male meal. Okay. Um, we, we have had during this pandemic uh, the PSNI saying that a main meal isn't constituted by a burger and chips. Yet when one of our members phoned Belfast City Council that morning, it was confirmed to him that a main meal constituted a burger and chips. So it, it's, it's just ridiculous. It's, it's down to you know, what one interprets as, as a main meal. But what you have to recognise is that not everyone whilst it may be desirable uh, to have an event at a hotel, not everyone can afford that. But uh, someone who's fortunate to be a member of a private member club could have a family event there because he's a member of that club uh, and find it much more affordable. Um, so it, it shouldn't really be down to that, you know? Yeah. Uh, I, I find it all very strange that they're trying to control a sector which contributes so much to society. I really do. Just I, I'm still at, at, at a loose end here. I, I still cannot see where you're coming from because in the club's order, I don't read that, and I haven't got the club's order at hand here, which I had. 
But the, the club's John, order. John, this is the new good. legislation that will be coming in for clubs and bars. So we're looking at the legislation here. So this will be <coughs> you as well. This will be covering you as well. That's where Kelly's coming from. This is the new draft legislation um, that this lister had sent in the information about. So some of the clauses mm -hmm. in that are not the same as the existing legislation. They're proposing oh, new yes. things. Um, yes, there's the other thing, to be honest, you've mentioned it before yourselves, that um, young people prohibited from bars. So what they're saying then is that um, between the 1st of June and the 31st of August, and you rightly so have said within your paper that you've submitted to us, that you would prefer that time period to be extended. Now, I'm just thinking, you guys cover an awful lot of different types of sporting clubs across the whole area and when we're thinking about that um, have you any idea just on the percentage of sporting clubs that do not hold their awards ceremonies in the summertime those that hold things in the autumn time you don't have an idea uh, of the percentages not real probably uh, I, I couldn't confirm that okay. number no okay. um, um, but the Sports are, sports are very, very varied, as you'll be aware of. Yeah. Um, but if you, you have to, if the other thing you have to realise with respect to clubs is that each member of a club is actually a, an owner. He's an owner of the club. Yeah. So if he wants to have an event in that club, which he is already an owner of, um, it's very hard to deny it. And why should he not be able to do that? But once again, I think we're focusing far too much on alcohol. This is not about alcohol. I can go into a club, but I, I would drink very, very little. I would be a social drinker, but very, very occasionally. So it's not about that. And that, I think that agenda uh, tends to give clubs, and, and in many cases public houses, a very bad press. Uh, and I think we need to steer away from that. And we have to look at what the, the actual legacy of the club sector is contributing to society, whether it be a support of... And I, I can give you an example. I've got a paper sitting in front of me here. Um, one of your members there, Robin Newton, will be aware of my connection with Fleming Clinton School, which goes back many, many years. And I've got a, a, an old paper here, the first edition of a newsletter I introduced from back in 1995. It's called The Early Years. There it is. Uh, just coincidentally, it's on my desk because I was at another meeting. And, so, in that there, I mean, I can assure you that there was a, an outdoor sports food required for the disabled uh, children to be able to train before they went off to the, the Olympics. And that sports ground was, um, you know, I was very humbled by the fact it was named after me, but that's by the by. It was financed by the network of clubs who put up the finance to put that sports field there and the Duchess of Gloucester came over to open it and recognition, a recognition was afforded to the club sector who networked the finance to put it there. Similarly, they needed a, a family room for parents to meet teachers. The Showbiz Karate Club, which ran all their charitable events in social clubs, they provided the money to start that family room and get it completed. Likewise, down in Shimda Valley in Newcastle, the Cancer Fund for Children required a new kitchen. The Showbiz Charity Club contributed, I believe, £20,000 to that. All that money was raised in the network of clubs. So we need to steer away from the emphasis to alcohol and look at the, the contribution the clubs make to the social uh, fabric of Northern Ireland. I absolutely agree with you there. I know, John, you had mentioned that you hadn't been consulted with on this liquor licence. Well, um, what, 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 what I've got in front of me here, and it says sports clubs, and it says uh, Clause 28, private functions. Clause 28 amends Article 32 of the Clause Order. No person can hit it from bar. The introduce a new paragraph DA to correspond to those provisions set out in Clause 12 of the bill and will allow young people to remain in the bar area of a registered club to provide certain conditions. So to remain in the bar area uh, while their parents or adult custodians are, and, and are in the vicinity of them. And it does say young person prohibited from bars, clause 29 and uh, uh, article 32 of the club's order. Young person prohibited from bars. It extends the last time that young people under 18 years of age may be in the area of a sporting club premise from 10 to 11 a.m. during the summer months, but we're ready as June to August. So the time that they're allocated for a young person to be on site 
and what we're saying is that come in, it's, uh, and now you're saying, that, which we haven't seen, they have to be provided by a meal. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Last night, Glen Corn was playing at Arm in the County Mountain Shield. Now, a lot of supporters go in their taxi, their bought their cars and uh, hired buses, and then they come back to the club with their children to pick up their cars and then go back in the club to talk in, uh, of the night's events. Now, that's happening throughout the province in the winter months and the summer months. I am not aware of any regulations that tells us that there has to be a meal supply. This is completely new. What I would ask is that um, this is new legislation that's being consulted on at the moment. I think it would be useful if your organisation maybe um, added your voice to the consultation that the committee is doing. So we've heard from you today, but it might be worthwhile to look at the new draft legislation that has been produced and to look at that type of private functions to see how that's going to work for yourselves. I know the committee has circulated that online and it's available through the assembly website and, and through Facebook and social media channels. But it would be useful for us because we're scrutinising this in order to make sure that this new legislation is going to work for you and for everyone. Um, yes, so th that would be good to get your feedback in that if you could respond to that consultation, please. Yeah. No, okay, it's, it's, you. It's very, yeah, sorry, you. It's, it's very valuable that, that you've highlighted that and uh, brought it to our attention. Um, but, uh, you know, yet again, we have to steer away from, from alcohol. But one thing I would say in respect to this, we have been to several meetings, and I referred earlier to a meeting in Down Patrick Creek where the, where the PSNI attended. And the big concern at that time was the blue bag problem. Kids, blue bags, going into parks, uh, causing antisocial behaviour. Surely, if there is a concern about that, is it not better to see young people uh, uh, witnessing alcohol taken in con a controlled environment by good example, uh, rather than looking upon it as a mystery that they pursue? Uh, with a blue bag hiding in a park somewhere. Um, so th that, that's something you have to take on board as well. And I know as a parent and grandparent, I would much prefer my children to see good practice uh, than to try and go and pursue uh, a mystery and see what it's all about uh, and, and learn bad, bad practice. So that, okay. That's, that's Harry, thank you for that. Uh, I mean, and, and this is the reason why we have you in today is because that's why we want to ask you those questions. So I'm glad Kelly did bring that that to your notice, um, because that will that will have significant difficulties um, for the likes of clubs. But that's why we need. Um, you know the consultations out at the moment, and that's why we need responses to that consultation around the difficulties. So it was good that that was highlighted. I have Alex that wants to come in and ask a question as well. Alex, go ahead. Kelly, were you finished there? Yes. yes sorry. Yes. Sorry, thank you, Alex, go ahead. Thank you for your presentation, and I'll be very quick with my question. Um, the bit you mentioned about the hours of use for clubs by minors. Um, you mentioned about extending from um, the summer months to April to October. What, what's, what's the rationale for that period of extension? Well, uh, if I can just come in on that wee piece, if you go around the coastlines of Northern Ireland, you see all the, the, the yacht clubs, sail clubs and boat clubs. The young boys and girls are out in their hundreds, if not thousands, in the summer months. If you go to all the academies, the GAA, football, cricket, golf, etc., right down the line, you see again all these young boys and girls pursuing their sports under under the auspices and guidance of coaches. When no, when no sports and, and that, that that recreation is over, sport and recreation is over, you know, it's naturally and logical that they should be able to come into their club rooms, probably to go into the, the changing room to change from what uh, sports they live on, and this, and to be in the company of their parents or often an adult who's coaching with them. And that seemed to be the logical, and that always way it has been. And I'm, I'm, I'm a bit surprised that there's now going to be changes to make it a bit more difficult for that to happen. I was back when I remember when, when Rory McElroy was only a boy, look, it was at primary school, and you seen him bouncing a, a golf ball off, off, off his club, and that was taking place inside his club room at Hollywood. And that, that event is, is happening all over the province in sports clubs. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, thank you for that. Okay, no other member has asked any questions. Can I just then again say to Lawrence um, uh, that if you can send in some further information on the accounting issues, and, and I know there you'd said that you'd wanted this to be included in, in the bill, that's the Article 40. Um, so just to, to back that up, that that is included in the bill, I can see I, that makes sense and I can see the reasons behind that. So, um, Lawrence, if you could send that in to us, mm -hmm. and then um, can I then thank as well then um, Harry and John for coming in and briefing us today. Um, if there's anything further, of course, you can um, add anything written to us as well. Um, and uh, because we know that this bill, I mean, it's it, this bill is intended to amend the club's order. So, therefore, um, what is in this bill is is how how you as 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 members of, of the federation and, and and members of clubs um, will have to conduct how you run those clubs going into the future is will be contained in the new bill. Um, so thank you very much for your time today. Really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay, members. Um, then. We're going to move on then to agenda item seven. Members happy enough that we move on then? Yes, okay. Agenda item seven then is a departmental briefing on the COVID-19 culture, languages, arts and heritage program. Um, members, um, you'll find the background information is in t uh, tabled research briefing paper. Oh, yeah, I've said all that wrong. <laughs> members, <laughs> background information for this item has been provided in a tabled research briefing paper by Assembly Research on the impact of COVID-19 on, on culture, arts, culture in, in Northern Ireland. Um, this briefing paper will be in next week's pack for further considerations. And a copy of the briefing paper from the department is at page 41. So can I then welcome to the meeting uh, Maeve Walls and Joanna Gray. Um, Maeve, is it yourself that's going to kick off? I'm going to kick off, Chair, and um, I have received notice to keep my remarks brief because I know you want um, lots of time for questions. Okay. I also note that I, we are joined uh, from the department by Ian Greenway, the Director in Historic <coughs> Environment Division. Um, who's been an, an important part of the rollout of the programme. So if I might then thank you for the opportunity to present to you about the department's 29 million COVID-19 culture, languages, arts and heritage programme. Um, like I say, joined by Ian Greenway and by Joanna Gray, who is the programme manager. You've been provided by with written brief, briefing, as you've said, and um, there is no need for me to revisit that detail now. But just to recap briefly on some of the background to the programme and to tell you a bit more about the schemes which are live at the moment and then very happy to take your questions. It is very clear that the pandemic has disproportionately impacted the culture, languages, arts and heritage sector and we have all heard the claim that that's a sector that has been first to close and will be last to reopen. We have all been denied access to much of our creative and cultural content for nine months, artists, musicians, DJs, linguists, heritage professionals, venue operators, and many other creatives have suffered not just from loss of income, but by being prevented by being prevented from what they do and love, um, expressing themselves and inspiring others. The very significant financial interventions agreed by the executive are vital to protect the thriving creative sector we've all worked hard to build, as well as rebuild the local economy and achieve social renewal. On 18th of September 2020, the Executive allocated an additional 29 million to support the culture, languages, arts and heritage sector. This was in addition to 4 million allocated in July and an earlier allocation from the Department of 1.5 million in April in the weeks immediately after um, the beginnings of the pandemic. The evidence continues to emerge about the impact of the virus on the culture, languages, arts and heritage sector. The department has been forced to develop policy at an unprecedented pace and with sub-optimal sub data and evidence. Um, since March the 16th, we have established funding programmes in this sector to the value of 34.5 million. We've done as much as we possibly can to mitigate the risk of not providing effective support to those most in need as quickly as possible. We're working closely with sectoral partners and we've done that from the very beginning. We're working with academics and the commercial sector to ensure <coughs> standing of need is as comprehensive as possible 
and that we are ready to adapt as more information becomes available. We have revised and adjusted in successive funding programmes um, as the detail of the need becomes more apparent. The Minister's priority is to manage immediate financial pressures and prevent closures of a large number of culture, language, arts and heritage organisations. And added to this, she wishes to preserve sectoral skills and prevent job losses, as well as financial interventions to, to ensure the survival of organisations. She also recognises that further stimulus is needed to develop new work and undertake changes to respond to new demands. People's lives have changed and so have their cultural motivations, habits and their needs. Things we know are not going to go back to how they were and the sector and the department are working together closely and collaboratively to understand and respond to those changing needs. The Minister's vision is that everyone in society should engage in and be enriched by what culture, language, arts and heritage have to offer and that means it must be accessible to those in need and deliver tangible benefits through new and innovative projects and interventions which can tackle poverty, social exclusion, disadvantage and isolation. So the programme's policy framework is designed to do two things. It's designed to stabilise these sectors and to secure a future which is representative of their spread, diversity and reach prior to the pandemic. This includes their geographic spread and access. It includes diversity to the whole collection of subgenre and sectoral groupings with no sector lost entirely and reach in terms of the benefits delivered to citizens being preserved with no section disproportionately impacted. The programme then delivered in two parts, the bulk being distributed to sectoral organisations and individuals to mitigate the impacts of the pandemic and to stabilise these sectors. Um, the stability focus of the scheme includes two large-scale schemes by delivered by the Arts Council and National Lottery Heritage Fund to stabilise organisations in those sectors. The schemes closed to applications on Friday the 27th of November and applications are now being checked. That process has begun against basic eligibility criteria. They'll be subject to full assessment and final decisions in the new year. Both schemes were oversubscribed. We can't yet tell to what extent until those eligibility checks are carried out. The Minister announced yesterday that she was releasing a further £3.25 million to the Arts Council for individual artists and freelance creatives, and that will open on, September, on December the 17th. We have a number of partners delivering support for the Indigenous language sector as part of the overall scheme. They include the Ulster Scots Agency, Conrad Nagelige and Kishja in Asiakta, and the department itself in respect of sign language partnership group and organisations um, in, in that sector. Calls for applications to the schemes have just closed and again too early to be definitive about demand. The delivery bodies themselves have reported um, a really significant level of interest. A three million allocation has been made available to local councils in recognition that they own and operate a range of arts centres, theatres and local museums and heritage assets which are also at risk due to pandemic restrictions. On the renewal side, a range of partners are delivering schemes with us to support new projects. The largest of those has been delivered by the Community Foundation with a £2 million budget, and they've been assessing applications for small grants from community organisations as they're submitted, and they've already supported 83 projects with £1 million worth of funding. Projects these are designed to reignite our creative and heritage um, activity and to reanimate communities and spaces, commissioning new work from artists and creative people. Early concerns that new projects might be difficult to look to deliver in the remainder of this financial year have been replaced with a real sense of optimism about the energy and inspiration shown by community groups. Other delivery partners for renewal funding include the Architectural Heritage Fund and the National Churches Trust. The Minister met delivery organisations, all of them, on Tuesday of this week to hear updates from them and she and we were heartened and encouraged by the positivity that was being shown. This project aims not just to preserve the sectors but to strengthen and ensure they're fit for purpose. Um, the Minister then is also committed to developing a culture, arts and heritage strategy looking to the longer term and this programme and all who are contributing to it and delivering it um, will help inform that longer term strategic 
thinking and the strategic actions around it. Our delivery partners are working at pace and with purpose to deliver support, getting to those who need it as quickly as possible, and they're working closely with applicants and sectoral bodies. The impact of the programme will become clearer in the new year, when large-scale interventions being delivered by the Arts Council and Lottery Heritage will be fully assessed and awards determined. And we as officials would be happy to provide the committee with a further update in the new year and to provide details for the 13 delivery partners involved should you wish to seek further operational details from them. Thank you and we welcome any questions. Okay, Maeve, thank you very much for that and we absolutely welcome you here today because we know we've had so many funding streams from this committee um, right across the board. It has been hard to keep track of them all, so I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that you've been able to join us. Um, I just want to ask a few questions. Um, firstly, around the, the, the organisational funding that closed on the 27th of November um, that was distributed by the Arts Council. I know I have certainly got feedback um, over the last couple of weeks before it actually closed from various organisations on the difficulties that they had in completing that application um, because for some of those smaller organisations they don't have that raft of people on board of accountants, of form fillers, of people that are you know, professional in applying for funding, um, the fact that the, some of the information they had to get together um, the fact that they had to have two members that were not related um, that were that were able to sign off on the accounts, which for a lot of small organisations that is not the case as well. So from what I've heard, there's been quite a few people um, because of the application process uh, for organisations have been frozen out because of of because of the of that. Um, it's just then to ask you. You'd said it has been oversubscribed. Which is, I, I actually think that is good news when I hear something has been oversubscribed because that means then that's where the, the minister then needs to go and, and fight for, for more money for that. It's just on that on that application. Have you, as a department, received any um, anything from any of those artists um, who are part of organisations of the difficulties, or has it just been MLAs that have been hearing that? Um, secondly, on that as well, another issue I think has that will transpire out of that also is. Uh, whenever that uh, you'd said there yourself, full assessment and decisions, um, you're hoping to have that early in the new year. Um, for the decisions on that, it leaves such a very short time frame for that um, that amount, and some of them will be vast amounts of money uh, or large amounts of money. That, that really very tiny time frame that they have to have that spent by by the end of March, that I imagine will cause some difficulties. Is can there be any leeway on that? Um, and then I just want to ask you then the same about the, the individuals and freelancers, one that is being rolled out on the 17th of December. Again, it's very, very welcome because there are, are so many uh, so many independents and freelancers um, that have been unable to avail of other funding and that absolutely 100% welcome that. Again, if that is only opening on the 17th of December, it, it's likely to run for whatever period, four weeks, say, into, well, you've, you've got uh, Christmas as well on top of that. Um, but whenever they are then, uh, a decision is made on their funding, what is the length of time they will have? Do they ha Is there a stipulation on there? money that they'll receive that it has to be spent in a certain amount of time and then also can I just then comment then on the strategy as well I know that those working within the arts have been calling for a, a strategy in general for, for a very long time um, but I, I welcome this absolutely to look at the, the strategy to, well, to look at the long, longer term effects um, just if you could give then also on that a little bit more concrete um, maybe a time frame on that um, uh, as to when you imagine that strategy will be ready then for us as a committee even um, to be able to look at. Okay. Just a small list there, Maeve, for you. Okay, so yeah. um, thank you for those questions. If I start and then I'm going to ask Joanna, who's closer to the detail on this, to come in. But your first question was around, was the department, is the department aware, of, have officials been made aware of um, some difficulty that some have been experiencing in relation to complexity of applications and um, we are aware uh, of a small number who have felt that I mean our, our um, sense of this is that you know that round of funding was allocating awards of up to half a million pounds and so it was right and proper that um, the necessary degree of diligence was being applied there um, the nature of the funding here is that for the 
the applications were being received by the Arts Council from organisations who have not previously been on their radar and that has been purposefully in the design of the scheme that its reach was wide so the Arts Council couldn't rely on these being organisations who were necessarily known to them um, and for the most part they continue to deploy funding process that they have been using for some time simply because of the necessity of speed in this one. Um, the Arts Council did provide some webinars for applicants and we were assisted also by Ulster University and the Future Screens project which was making some technical assistance available to applicants but if I can ask Joanna perhaps to come in on that question Joanna if there's anything to add if, if, with your agreement. Sure. Sure, okay. Um, can you guys, can you hear me okay? Anne and Dave, Joanna, yes. Okay, good stuff. Um, yeah, I think it's important to say as well that um, the other large scale element of the program is being delivered through the National Lottery Heritage Fund um, on a very similar basis with the requirement for applicants to present previous accounts, management accounts and um, projections so that it's um, possible to determine their need. And we haven't had any indication that anyone has had any difficulty on that side at all. Um, but I do understand that filling forms is difficult for organisations at the minute, particularly when perhaps some staff are on furlough and um, trustees are having to uh, lift some of the load. So, you know, we have all of the delivery partners that are involved in the programme are available to take calls from applicants. I know that's a little bit too late now for Arts Council and National Lottery because their schemes have closed, but certainly the other ones that are still open, the delivery partners are there to help. Um, just on the time frame, yes, it seems short that payments would only be being made in the new year, but this is not project funding. Um, this is funding to uh, essentially fill deficits, and it's for the period from the 1st of April. Uh, 2020 through to the 31st of March uh, 2021. So organisations are presenting um, what they have lost, what they have saved perhaps through furlough and other reductions in um, activity and essentially what funding they have available and what their remaining need is. And then individual uh, grant awards are being tailored to allow them to replenish their financial situation, including reserves. So it's not a key is so of they'll get some funding in February and they have to do a project by the end of March. This is actually just to stabilise their financial position for the entire financial year. Um, you mentioned also, Chair, about individuals and the scheme opening on the 17th of December. Uh, um, obviously, Arts Council have just recently closed the last individuals call, um, but the turnaround is expected to be very quick on that. And unlike organisations, there isn't an end date for individuals to spend. Um, so it's again, it's not going to be a case of you have to deliver some activity uh, by the end of the financial year. And I think as may have said, in relation to the strategy, work is certainly underway and the Minister is very keen to bring that forward as quickly as possible. Um, this program we're hoping will inform some of the thinking on the strategy because one of the requirements for applications for organisations is that they submit um, they're thinking on renewal planning, sort of medium and longer term thinking, how they are dealing with potential closures at the moment and, and how they are going to manage um, the operational side of reopening. And that obviously is going to be really valuable information for policymakers. Thank you, Joanna. That has been, that's cleared up um, quite a lot of issues. Thank you for answering that. I know it asked there about the strategy as well, um, and just when we're likely to see something more concrete to do with uh, with a, a strategy. Um, I don't know if either one of you can answer that. Okay. I mean, I, I'm happy to pick that up, and um, I think what we have to say on that is we cannot yet be specific on that. We need to. I mean, we 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 know, and we clearly. The Minister is wishing to get this driven out as quickly as possible. Um, our priority has been to get this funding programme shaped um, and on the ground and, and then to move swiftly to the development of the strategy. And all of that engagement that Joanna has described has been um, to really good purpose. So we have been gathering information as we've been going through this about the kind of priorities that organisations are seeing for the future and what their priorities are and what shape of the sector they see. So I think once we get down into the very focused work on the strategy, um, we've got all of that groundwork done. 
Thanks. I have just one more issue that's just come into my head there. I, um, the, now, this is hearsay, so I, hopefully it, it is incorrect, but I had heard from um, uh, uh, an artist um, that the Arts Council provide funding for recognition for artists, so they do, and they'll, pro they'll provide a, a funding to various artists, organisations, whoever that might be, um, every year just in recognition of, of work that they have done and to go towards work that they're, they're going to do in the future. Um, from what I have heard, the people have been told that if you received this recognition award from the Arts Council, you were not entitled to apply for a COVID-19 award. I wanted to know just, and I say it is hearsay and I hope it's incorrect, um, but if not, did that come from the department to tell um, the Arts Council that someone could not apply for COVID-19 help if they received uh, a recognition award from the Arts Council or, or, um, or do you know anything about that? Um, I don't I know that. Yeah, Joanna, if Chair, if I might I was going to say that, yeah, the eligibility criteria don't um, exclude anyone. In fact, even individual artists who received funding in the first uh, in the tranches that the Arts Council were rolling out in the summer are eligible to apply for the next tranche opening on the 17th of December. No, look, that's okay. Thank you. And as I say, it is hearsay. Um, but when we do have the Arts Council in front of us in two weeks' time, so it'll certainly be a question I will be asking of them. Look, thank you. I'm going to open up here um, for some members who are wanting to ask questions. of Kelly. Thank and you very Sinead, and then of Mark. Sorry, thank you very much, Chair. Um, Folks, can I just confirm, so we had the 29 million additional funding that came through on top of the other um, funding that was already um, secured. Uh, am I reading your report right to say that that's it, the 33 million plus more has actually been allocated now and it's in process of being ruled out to people? Yeah, absolutely. So 4 million um, allocated by the executive in July and then... 29 million agreed on the 24th of September, and the Department and Arts Council topped that up slightly. So yes, it's a little bit more than 33 actually being made available as COVID support. So of that amount of money, 34 uh, point whatever, I can't remember what may have said there, sorry, but I'm just wondering um, how much, I know that that is what the department has allocated and it's, gone, it's going through the systems. How much of it's actually out there with those artists and organisations? How much of that 33 million is actually with them at the minute? None of the stability funding um, has actually been allocated to grantees yet um, because those schemes just closed Arts Council and uh, National Lottery Heritage Fund applications just closed on the 27th of November. We have a number of schemes for the language sector um, which have just closed yesterday um, and we also have funding which is going to councils and we're talking to Solas about that so it hasn't actually um, been awarded to grantees yet um, as I say it's a case of actually uh, making good deficits that have been accumulated across the year um, so that, so that organisations are stabilised some of our renewal funding though has already gone to grantees. The Community Foundation are administering a £2 million fund for new projects and new work. And obviously, you know, the point about this being late in the year in relation to new work is well made. And so that's rolling, that's being administered on a rolling assessment basis and they've already made 83 awards. So that's the, that's the good news that there is new activity happening and that will include commissioning artists to um, work with communities and, and so on to actually do new things. And Chair, if I might add to that then, on the specifics, um, Kelly, of the question about what's, what's already out there. So to keep this as simple as I can, what's already out there from the first two tranches um, is um, for individuals uh, an, an amount of 4.427 million having been paid to 1,313 individuals and two rounds of funding under the organisation's emergency programme with grants totalling 2.85 million to 212 organisations. These are from the earlier rounds, the 4 million and the 1.5. <coughs> and in addition to that, there's been grants awarded to four larger organisations totalling 619,000. They've included the Lyric, the MAC, the Crescent Arts Centre and the Ulster Orchestra. 
As you can imagine, whenever people hear that type of figures out of 33 million, um, they would be thinking, oh, there's lots of money still left there. But it's now all been allocated. There is some that is going to the heritage side of communities. Um, what, what sort of percentage of the 33 million then is going there? I wonder if, our, Joanna, do you want to pick this up or, or Ian, perhaps Ian? Um, I'm not sure if Ian, Ian okay. might be we, having a technical Ian, difficulty in being Ian, able to come in. Ian, is there an audience? If we could move, okay, I see Ian, yep, Ian, we've got him in spotlight now. There you go, Ian, we can see you. Oh, so can you hear me? There seems to be some technical issues in the background, whether they're my fault or not, I'm not sure, I apologise. We can hear you loud and clear. Thank you, Kelly and Paula. Um, the, there is the main fund via the National Lottery Heritage Fund is for 5.5 million of the 33 to heritage organisations and individuals. And then there are some smaller specific heritage funds via the Architectural Heritage Fund via National Churches Trust and the Community Heritage Fund for small project renewal projects via NLHF. And then some of the funds will straddle heritage and culture arts language, including the Community Foundation Fund, and indeed the money to councils, because that will straddle their museums as well as their art centres and theatres. Okay. So it's hard to be definitive quite how that number lies, but 5.7, six and a bit, I'd say half of that council money, it'll be 8 million or so, I would have thought. Can I just check then, of the money that's going out at the moment, it's all COVID related and it relates to the loss of income. A lot of it's to do with the loss of income and sustaining the sector. But I'm just wondering, um, from my experience just of the individuals grants that went out the first time, there was a huge amount of people um, not able to meet the criteria because of what was defined as income. Can you just explain to me why those individual artists weren't able to, what, what is the definition of income? Is it gross, net, what was used? Uh, I'm wondering, uh, Joanna, if you want to, I mean, I, I, I'm happy to uh, begin this, Joanna, if you want to come in the detail. I think where there were issues about individual artists in the initial fund was really tied to the production of new work, Kelly, that um, we we got feedback after the first uh, tranche of allocation that it wasn't helpful to necessarily tie work to the production, to, to tie a grant award to the production of new work um, and so there was a relaxation on that point uh, between that and the second tranche of allocation. Okay. Uh, Joanna, I don't know if you want to say anything more about what classifies as income um, or if perhaps that's one to be taken up directly with the Arts Council and we're happy to raise that with them and um, have detail provided, Kelly, to you. But Joanna, is there anything that you want to add to that? Very cold. I think yeah, maybe just worth saying that the department recognises that the... Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Yes, we can. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, worth saying that the department recognises that the policy framework was developed on the basis of suboptimal evidence. And that's because, you know, we're in a pandemic and we were, as we have said, making policy at pace. And obviously we drew on as much sectoral information as we possibly could, including survey information from Arts Council and others about the need. But it is difficult um, still to um, determine demand in advance. And so Arts Council have a budget available for individuals um, and they do have to have as part of that a prioritization element in case there is over demand against that budget. So for that reason, they are asking, and it's not just individual artists, I should say as well, it's a very, very broad swathe of freelance and self-employed creative individuals and National Lottery Heritage Fund are providing funding to um, heritage professionals. But there is an expectation that individuals will demonstrate that they have lost income as a result of the pandemic um, and that they will demonstrate that they have been working in the sector um, previously and you know that that work has stopped or reduced as a result of the pandemic but it, we have tried our best to make it as as um, to you know so that it is not onerous that it is simple as possible and that the criteria are as broad as possible that anyone who is working in the creative sectors is eligible to apply okay there isn't anything there about they have to be working in the sector for two years or anything like that no no, 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 no. Okay. 
Yeah, just current. Okay. Um, that would be useful to find out, um, you know, just how this next round is going to go. So we're not we're not going to protect the head of that. But I'm going to ask the department just um, the the minister has very kindly written to the committee to confirm that the arts council has issues with its IT and there will be work done necessary work being done um, for three weeks now. Um, you've just said that there are a number of of uh, you know um, awards or grants that have just completed, you know, people have handed it in. Have you any concerns that because that IT system is down, that the processing of those grants that have just finished will be delayed? Or are you happy with, with the process that the Arts Council is going to use in the interim? No, we have good assurance from the Arts Council. I think just to, I think that the system being down is maybe a bit of a misnomer. Um, because and my understanding from Arts Council is that because they have um, just recently closed their last call for individuals. They have to bring their system down for a certain period in before they can open it back up again. And that's why it will open again on the 17th of December. But there will be pre-application information available to in individuals before that date. In fact, it'll be, it'll be available to them very soon um, so that they know exactly what they need to submit yeah. when the applications open. So it's not a case that the Arts Council are having IT issues or problems. It's a case that their system has to be refreshed in order then to reopen properly for the next round. That's a bit of a relief. Um, I'm just thinking as well that that grant for the individuals, um, I can absolutely understand that that those who missed out the first time round will be coming to this one um, with great expectations. But it's over Christmas and the new year. So I'm just wondering the deadlines. I think maybe you had said there that it, there isn't a closed deadline for that one, is there? Or how does that take into account that period? There is. It's going to close on the 7th of January. Happy Christmas to all those independent artists. Is there any way that that could be extended to allow them the opportunity? Because I'm sure if we get word from the executive that restrictions are lifted, those people are going to be trying to make money to make up for this, you know, the hiatus that they've had. Um, is there any way that that can be extended? I think we can certainly talk to Arts Council about that. I suspect that what they'll say is if it's extended, then that will... Uh, create a further delay on actually getting payments to individuals and that's the trade-off because it's an open close assess process and um, you know they they need to actually close in order to look at the cohort that have applied to understand the demand and the prioritization that might need to take place so the further out you push the close date the further out you're pushing actually getting money into people's pockets okay so it's not a fixed amount then it's a it's a variable amount depending on loss of income it's up to five thousand um, pounds, seven and a half thousand pounds for disabled artists who have support needs. Um, so it's it's slightly variable, but not it's not individually tailored. Okay, okay. Um, I just think that um, you guys have been going through it as much as as other departments have. It, it's it's been an awful time for everyone. Um, thank you for the work that has been done. I just think that there's a lot of frustration within the arts sector that this massive magic number of 33 million appeared and then there's been drip feeding of different grants have come out as different ones have been released. But there never seems to have been an announcement that's the 33 million spent. And I'm just worried that the sector thinks that you know there was four million for this and two million for that and and you know just under a million for the large organisations that there's still a pot there. Is there some um, consideration to um, some sort of um, advertising or promotion to say you know this is the last grant that's coming out? It is. It's tricky because it's such a large um, program and there are so many and you know there are there are twenty individual elements to this so I understand how difficult it is for you know someone who's not a civil servant or a politician to who's not steeped in these things to understand it um, we have published a table um, I think we gave the link to the committee as well at the end of your written yeah. briefing um, but to be honest even that table I know has been of interest to sectoral organizations um, I'm not sure an individual artist would find it all that useful and we have had feedback from the sector that all of this COVID support funding is very confusing for people so we have been trying to promote it in as clear and concise a way as possible but um, it is um, important to say that all of the funding has been allocated to distribution bodies so there isn't any funding that is still sitting around waiting to have approvals or um, policy decisions made about it. Yeah.
Um, it's just a case now of actually those delivery bodies making assessments of applications. And one of the delivery bodies, of course, is going to be the council, so they're due to get money still. Yeah, so that, that's part of it. Um, just very finally, sorry, Chair, um, I just wanted to go back. Sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry, if I might say, Kelly, just for absolute clarity, the money for councils will be for their own funds where they operate, for instance, the, the, the Castle Museum in Bangor. It isn't money they will be distributing to third parties. Oh, thanks for that clarification, yeah. Ian. Much appreciated. Um, I'm just wondering as well, that there was something else I was going to ask. Um, yes, the Ulster University's report about the number of people who are unfortunately leaving the sector purely for financial rather than you know wanting to leave the sector. I'm just wondering, and that strategy to build back up the sector again for sustainability, um, what sort of funding have you have you got for that? I take that separate to the 33 million. Um, you'll be looking for more funding to help with that. The, the, Kelly, the short answer to the question is uh, we have no funding yet secured for that and um, beyond what um, would be in normal budget allocations. Okay. Um, I think it's, yeah. we, we are aware of that and that's a point made in all of our engagement with the sector. But, um, once we reach the end of this current financial year, and the question was asked earlier, Chair, about the flexibility that is around the 29 million, um, and the answer to that is there is very, very little flexibility around it. And that is that is in-year funding, and that's been a big part of the challenge with this. So, um, so we are not immune to the fact that next year is going to be a challenge, deeply challenging year. I think it'll be very challenging if, if unfortunately some of the delivery bodies can't get it all out and we're having to give money back at a time when the department is struggling to, to fund you know, sustainability programmes. But no, thank you very much. I know I asked a lot of questions there. Um, Ian, good to see you again. I tortured Ian in the past and through transport. But um, no, my thoughts with you all, and please pass on our thanks to um, all, of, all of the members of staff. It has been a tough time. The arts sector has, has had it extremely tough. And I know later today we'll hear more from, from one of them. But um, no, thank you very much. OK, thanks, Kelly. Um, I've got Sinead and then I've got Mark. Sinead. There we are. Can you, can you hear me here? Can I go ahead, Sinead, yes. OK, great, thank you. Um, and thanks for the briefing, guys. Um, and just to say, look, I think... Um, the amount of money that's been allocated to the arts from this department and from this minister has been phenomenal. Phenomenal, And just to place on record our, our thanks to the hard work of everybody who's trying to get this money out the door as quick as possible to those that need it. Listen, most of the questions that I had obviously have been, have been asked and have been answered um, by the previous speakers, but um, it was just to say the individual, the, the fund for the individual um, artists, the, the individual uh, creatives fund that's due to open on the 17th. Um, do we have any, is there any data available or do we have any understanding of what that, what the demand might be? Um, because, you know, again, I've got concerns around the, um, around the length of time the application is going to be open. And also it, the amount doesn't, you know, maybe seems a, a bit, well, actually, we don't know. We don't know what the demand's going to be, so we don't know if the amount's going to be able to meet it. Um, the other thing as well, I know there was some confusion on whether um, DJs were, uh, were were eligible for any of, of the funds. Um, my understanding is that they are, but you know, I suppose it would be helpful if officials could maybe just clarify that for us today. Yes, absolutely. DJs are eligible. I know that has been something our minister has been tortured a bit on as well. Um, and I think she met a cohort of them um, last week. What I will just say, though, um, is that DJs who are actually working in the sector, um, so, you know, if you've got a set of decks in your bedroom, that's not going to count. You actually have to have been earning income as a result of your talent and your skills and your kit. Um, but, yeah, DJs are definitely eligible. And that actually is why demand is not just DJs, but why demand is difficult to determine is because this is a very broad... Um, uh, eligibility for individuals. We know there are somewhere around 40,000 people working in the creative industries in Northern Ireland. Now, some of those will not necessarily need support, um, but many of them obviously do because obviously individuals have been very vocal about the difficulties they face. So 
you know, demand could be exceedingly high. As may have said, over a thousand individuals have already been supported, but we expect that there will be many more who haven't yet. Okay, I know, no, and I appreciate that that clarification, um, Joanna. I think uh, Ian, you answered the question in relation to Kelly's um, uh, Kelly's question around the council's fund. So, just to clarify, that is for that's not for them to distribute to to third parties. You said that's that's to plug a hole, basically that that they have been out over the COVID um, crisis. Yeah. That's correct, and uh, Solis is currently determining how that three million is divided out between councils because obviously they have differing numbers of museums and art galleries and theatres and, and, and other venues. Okay, no, it's just because we have you know a lot of the um, the the local um, art scene is, is you know it centres around the likes of Panto halls and things like that, um, and I know they're quite keen to to. Um, to understand if, if they're eligible for, for anything. And I suppose um, a way they would have seen, uh, a route they would have seen to access some of the funding is probably through the council. So is there any th any any of the funds there at all that that those sort of um, people, you know, specifically in those sort of sectors can access? Um, Shania, it might be worth saying, one of the themes that we picked up on the call with the delivery bodies um, earlier in the week, and the minister was on the call, was very strong sense from them that um, any anxiety that this would be money that was Belfast only, they were dispelling. They were, you know, all of them, they were talking about a spread, a geographical spread of applications that had come to them. Mm. So I think there's some encouragement to be taken from that. Um, I know it doesn't answer the specifics of your question about uh, the council one, but I think you know the indications are that this has achieved reach well beyond Belfast. Okay, I know that's, that's reassuring me. Thanks very much. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Sinead. And I suppose a, just a short supplementary to Sinead, then we, we will then see, you know, from the, the organisational funding that closed there just um, recently, or last week, was it, um, that we will be able to see from the result of that just how many of those small organisations that are, work within, especially within those rural communities, um, were able to avail of, of that funding. So that will be good to see um, whenever those figure, or whenever those, uh, we're not asking for every detail but some of those details become more apparent in the new year so that would be good to see um thanks Sinead um Mark Durkin Mark are you ready to come in thank you chair and thank you all uh for the presentation and, and for the work uh, that yourselves and staff have been doing I don't think for a second any of it's easy. It's difficult. It's difficult for uh, politicians and civil servants too. I would imagine, Joanna. <laughs> you said anyone who isn't one of the above would struggle with it, but I, I can assure you, we do. We, we we do as well. It's just that it has been as careless. It's very hard to keep abreast of developments in terms of financial interventions. Support schemes are announced. Some of them more than once. <laughs> it has to be said. They don't open for ages afterwards, and then when they do open, that 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 is another handling because some of them are, are particularly onerous and awkward. Uh, but but, but I, do, I do recognise that within the department, staff are having to do things that they've never uh, had to do before. But I think it's fair to say that we're in a situation that we've never been in before, and the sector and the individuals and organisations in that are struggling like they never have before and, and, and hopefully uh, never will again. Most of, of the questions I've been going to uh, ask have, have been asked and I have to say very well answered. Just uh, one thing there, it's following on the DJs and, and I think the question I was going to ask and is included in that too, but that's when people working in, not, not artists per se, but your sound engineers and so forth. Joanna, will they be included uh, in as eligible for, for the, the, this fund that's going to open? Absolutely. Um, anyone who is working in a very broad um, definition of the creative sector is included. And I know even Arts Council in their summer tranche have broadened it um, to the extent that there were lots of um, people working in the creative industry, sound engineers, roadies, um, you know, proofreaders, wedding singers. It really is, it really is very broad. and. Certainly, the tranche that's opening on the 17th of December, we really do want to see as broad a cohort as possible of people coming forward. So, 
anyone who's working in the creative sector and has lost income as a result of the pandemic um, will be eligible, yeah. And, and taking on board the point Kelly had raised there, or, or the question she'd asked about the possibility of extending the closing date, and I recognise uh, you, from your answer, Joanna, that that would be problematic in terms of delaying uh, processing and, and, and paying of awards. Is there any scope to bring forward the opening date? That's the difficulty with the IT system that Arts Council have because they have to clear the system before they can reopen again. So they're they're limited by the what the technology allows them to do on, on the opening date. But, but to, to overcome that slightly, what they are doing is um, putting up uh, application information. If it's not already on the web, website, it will be there very, very shortly so that anyone who's wondering, might I be eligible for this? What might I have to present? We'll be able to go on and see that long before the 17th of December. Okay, and the, the paper you had kindly furnished us with, I, I've lost it from in front of me here, but I think there was an, it was there half a million pounds given the Neighbourhood Renewal Partnerships or being given the Neighbourhood Renewal Partnerships. I'm just wondering, what, what uh, was there an application process for it or, or, or you know, was it just distributed yeah. across partnerships? It kind of, it's a bit of both, to be honest. Um, there's a, as I mentioned before, there's a two million pound scheme that's being delivered by the Community Foundation, um, which is, is essentially applications for small grants to do new projects, and it's directed at, at community groups essentially. But you know, it's open to everybody. But um, the idea is that they, they would bring forward, you know, small projects that will reanimate communities and do new things and and and, and do all of that. And what we wanted to recognise was that neighbourhood renewal areas will have. Um, in many cases, as part of their um, strategic action plans, plans for creative activity. And instead of them having to apply for the Community Foundation, what we said was that we will set some money aside for neighbourhood renewal areas in recognition that they are, are areas of particular interest. Um, so our um, colleagues in the department who work with the neighbourhood partnership boards are working with them at the minute. Now, they are asking them to fill out an application, but it's not in a competitive sense, as you would be obviously applying to the community foundation it really is just tell us what your project proposal is and you know we'll divvy up that ring fenced amount for neighborhood renewal amongst you so it's a kind of a guaranteed allocation based on them presenting some um proposal okay okay and then just just uh one thing finally and that was in terms of the grant to the larger organizations the six hundred and nineteen thousand. was it i was just one how that was done, how the organisations were selected. Was that a competitive uh, pr process? I'm conscious, or well, my constituents are certainly conscious of the fact that they're all Belfast-based organisations and, uh, and Belfast big and, and what have you, but, but there are large uh, organisations outside of Belfast as well. So I was just wondering how, how that had been done. Um, and pick that up and, and say, Mark, that that was done by process of dialogue between the Arts Council and, and the large organisations who are on their radar and who they've been working with for some time. Um, I'm happy to provide some further detail on that for you, but it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, um, an open application process, as I understand, but rather it was really getting down into very specific conversations with organisations about what their requirements were. Some of them had had staff um, furloughed, and so there were there wasn't necessarily the same degree of need. Some, as in the case of the um, the opera house, was closed for refurbishment. So, um, as I am understanding this, it was on a case by case basis. But I'm happy to follow that up with you, Mark. No, um, I would. Yeah. I, I would be grateful for further information on that, if possible. And please, Mev, thank you. And, and nice seeing you again as well, Ian. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Mark. Um, no other member has um, indicated they want to come in. I just have your table in front of me here at the moment. It's excellent, actually. I think I'm going to print it off. Yeah. Um, it does give all of that information there, so very well done. Look, thank you very much for coming and briefing the committee today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members. Um, that's good. I think uh, just before we move on to our, our, our next witness session, I mean, it was good to hear there that the likes of the Arts Council are receiving applications from people they've never received applications from before. And I, I would like to see that information. I wonder, would the committee be in agreement? Um, we know that um, Ulster Scots rolled out part of that funding, and so did those Irish language bodies as well. 
Um, would it be worthwhile maybe asking them for a written submission firstly to see just what the <coughs> scope of, of applications was? Because, um, and also I'd mentioned it in the chamber to the minister on Monday or Tuesday about uh, any oversubscription to any of those funds as well. So that would be interest with members um, be in agreement that we write to those organisations and ask them for a written briefing. I'd, li I'd like them to come in and do an oral briefing, but um, a written briefing would be good in the first instance. Would that be okay? Yeah. They ask about how the process went and you know where they oversubscribed and uh, were they hearing from people they'd never thought they've they'd heard of or from before and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, that would be good. Is that okay? All right. Sorry, Kelly, you want to say something else? Yeah, I was just going to say I'm. I still have a bit of a concern here because we have the the independent freelancers. I know is opening on the seventeenth of December, and as Joanna was indicating there, there's there's a lot. It's it's a broad brush, so there's a lot of people now should be able to apply, but it's just why were so many turned away in the first round? Yeah. I'm not 100% certain the criteria, you know, I know that, um, as, as Maeve had mentioned there, that, that, that they've learned from that and that criteria has changed. I'm not sure there's enough money that's going to touch the sides of this the second time round and having such a short cut off is concerning. I'm just wondering, could we write to the minister to formally ask, the committee's asking um, that the date is extended for this one and for a clarification of the criteria. I know it's going to be up soon, but it's just to see what's the difference between the first one and the okay. second one, if okay. possible. I, mean, I have no difficulty with that. The only difficulty is the longer, as they said, the longer that it's open for, the later people get their money because they have to wait until it closes before they actually look at the applications. I know. Um, but I, mean, they're, they're, I can certainly ask. Or we, sorry, not me, the committee can certainly or ask anything maybe, that you want. Maybe we should ask you know, for clarification. If, if we find, come the 7th of January, you know, that there is... There needs to be longer time where people are telling the artists are certainly going to let us know um, and the sector are going to let us know maybe it's is the minister open to extending this if well, it's it might required. be worth getting that in now because i know we went what you know a week before the musical instruments one was due to close and the minister didn't even see the letter um and then also the one last week where the organizational one which there was great problems around people getting their applications in as well so yes maybe we need to put that marker down early on to say Okay, if, if people are struggling or having problems getting applications in for that for that date, will she consider an yes. extension? Would that be okay to put it that way? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Andy, did you want to come in there? It was just, just, just on that point you covered it, Chair, is obviously I would just be concerned at moving the date to the right in any regard and the impact that that would have on yeah. getting the money out to the ground individuals, because I know quite a number have conveyed to me that they are in desperate need of this fund. Yeah. Um, but you no, know, take on board the point you're making that there needs to be a rapid response beyond that if there is money still left to be allocated. Okay, Mark, did you want to make a comment there? I, it was just uh, when we want to, I don't want it to be misconstrued or, or anything, but Kelly is quite rightly identified there. The, the concern that is there going to be enough money in this pot for, for everyone that needs to, to get out of it? And, and with that in mind and taking on board that the onerous uh, and cumbersome nature of a lot of these applications and the hoops that organisations and individuals have, have jumped through, I think there might be a slight concern then around the ring fencing of half a million pounds for neighbourhood uh, re renewal areas who, who, who do fantastic uh, work w without a doubt, but many of them then will need to outsource it to artists and organisations to help them to deliver these programmes, if they're deliverable at all, uh, in, in the time frame and under whatever restrictions. Well, we might not have any restrictions yet, but, but, but under uh, re restrictions uh, as they are, I, I, I just there seems to be a, a bit of a, an inequality there. Like I mean, neighbourhood renewals about tackling uh, poverty and closing gaps w w within communities, but we have artists here and, and people working in the sector and entirely dependent on the sector who are, have been plunged into poverty and uh, w w w with w with not much sign of hope of them getting out of it so so do you know if, if that's going to take away from from the, the chances of, of people who have been deprived of the opportunity to, to earn a living uh, for the last nine months and for god knows how long after i i, I think it's something that I, i'm not the only one that, that will have concerns about okay okay well then we can delve a bit deeper into that as well mark um, absolutely. Any members, anything else they want to comment on there? Or can we move on? Yeah, be all right. Okay, we'll move yeah, on. Just, just to qualify that a wee bit, it, it, it was just that the, 
there seems to be a lot of hand holding and, and spoon feeding going on, and I can understand the need to do that in, in, in instances. But when you compare it to the difficulty that artists and organisations mm-hmm. are, are encountering trying to apply f- f- for this money that they desperately need, it, th- there just seems to be an unfairness about it, in my opinion. No, I, th- I think you're. I think you're absolutely right there. Yeah. Okay. Um, can we move on, members? Yes, because I'm quite conscious we have Peter Corey, who's been hanging yeah. around here waiting probably for about at least an hour to get in here, and I'm quite conscious that we have a 30-minute time limit on this room. Um, so can I ask? Can I bring Peter into the spotlight? Um, hello, Peter. You're very welcome to our committee meeting. And we're sorry we have kept you waiting so long. Um, Peter, if I could just suggest that we we did receive a briefing from yourself. We have it here. Um, could I just ask that if you would just open with just a very, very short um, paragraph <laughs> or two, and that will allow us plenty of time for questions then, if that's okay, oh, Peter. Can you hear me okay, sir? I can hear you fine. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm glad you gave me that prefix because I was about to launch into something that would have gone on a lot longer. Um, I hope most of you know me here. If you don't, I'll just give you a little bit of background. I'm here not just as a not just as a performer, but also as a producer, the managing director of a production company, the artistic director of the largest performing arts school here in Northern Ireland, and as a mentor. I've been lucky enough to perform all over the world uh, in various stages and my productions have been touring the likes of Europe and the USA. My company, Peter Carr Productions, creates entertainment not only for theatres, but also for corporate events and local councils. Last year, we were lucky enough to employ over 150 people in various projects. I'm also passionate as an individual about working with young people and bringing on their artistic artistic experience through performing arts school and opportunities. Because of the nature of my experience, uh, I suppose I won't just be touching on the arts and entertainment and music, but also on tourism, on education and uh, on mental health. And I suppose that's my first point, that that the industry that I'm in is so diverse, as I can see you've been talking about. And I haven't minded actually sitting here listening because it's been very interesting for me to listen to. But you guys will understand through these conversations just how diverse this sector is. And what I feel is sometimes over the last few months, in fact, it's been touched on, that, that basically the legislation, which has been brought in in some cases on very short notice, has been in very broad strokes. And because of those broad strokes, the minutia of certain different areas of this industry hasn't been able to be catered for. Uh, I think that's something which hopefully, as things look to be maybe brighter in the future, um, can be addressed in a more subtle way, in a, in a way that maybe caters more for the different elements of the industry. At the start of this year, my, my, uh, my production company was, uh, was looking at a very busy year, our best year yet. Um, we deal in possibly two, diff- mostly two different ways. The first one is we put on productions in theatres uh, and the cost of those productions are paid for and indeed the profit comes from ticket sales alone. Secondly, we put on projects which are contracted by clients to create and to supply entertainment. This entertainment can be everything from singers and dancers through to snow machines and projections. Um, Like many in March, our diaries completely (laughs) disappeared. Uh, Everything that we had lined up for the year has gone. And we, I suppose we are down to around 20% of what we thought we would have brought in in 2020, uh, which is a a huge dip in what we had hoped to do. So the other thing I should say is we are not a company or me as an individual who looks for grants, who goes to the Arts Council, who relies on that for what we do. We really do it from a commercial point of view. And one of the experiences where I did try earlier this year to look at some sort of sponsorship and some sort of help from from the public sector was for driving concerts at the Titanic. They unfortunately weren't able to be supported. And it's a disappointment that they weren't because at the time when I was trying to put them on, uh, I thought it would have been, it would have been something that we all could have looked forward to. We'd all been in a couple of months of serious lockdown at that point. Also, they would have been the first concerts to have been put on anywhere in the UK or in Ireland. So I think there would have been a lot of exposure for Northern Ireland in that case. And finally, it would have, it would have given work to, to about 70 people who wouldn't have worked for four months at that point. But Mark's made the point there, uh, whereas some of these people still haven't worked in this 
is now seven months, nine months later, yeah. nine months later. It's a long time. It's a long time on counting uh, without being able to do what mm. you do. I suppose they're the main points. The other things I would like to say is this. Um, we provide, I believe my company provides a service. It provides a service the same way as somebody who sells a car, somebody who sells clothes, somebody who puts in a kitchen. But without wanting to make this time too theatrical or too over the top, the product we sell, well, it smiles. It's memories, it's inspiration. I know that sounds very grand, and it sounds, it sounds very over the top but, or theatrical, but I suppose I shouldn't apologize for that. Um, and if you take one particular example of that, let's just take music. Let's take songs. In any way, songs are the backdrop to the touchstone moments in our life. Whether that be remembering our parents when we were kids with a song, singing them singing it to you, whether it's the first dance you had with your wife or your husband, whether it's singing to your child on your knee, or whether you hear a piece of music and you miss somebody because you've heard that piece of music, somebody who is no longer with you. That is the power of music. That is the power of song. That is the magic of what we do. It's there to comfort, it's there to inspire. What we do is important for people. It's invaluable for their well-being, for a sense of community, and for many people's mental health. I hope this gives an opportunity this year for us to look upon music, entertainment, and the arts in a different way. The UK, and I have to say in particular, sadly, Northern Ireland, gives less per head than anywhere else in, the, in Europe. It's, the figures are quite disappointing, to say the least. And I would love to think that through this difficult situation we've all been in, that this can be addressed going forward. For some, music is a brilliant hobby, a social outlet, and a way of feeling part of a community. And for others, it's their career, it's their industry, and it's their profession. Those of us who are in this bracket enjoy what we do, but we feel sometimes over the last nine months especially that it seems to have been undervalued. Our music, our writers, and our dance is known all around the world, more than our plumbers, more than, more than our ability to make cars, and I include the DeLorean and that, and more than our garden centers. Music is what people from other countries understand about us. I remember one experience, I was in Inner Mongolia, would you believe, in a theater where I was singing to 5,000 people, and I started to sing Danny Boy, and they started to cheer. They, they cheered because they recognized that piece of music, that song, is the calling card for Northern Ireland. And, uh, and I was very proud of that. Every time I'm abroad, I use that opportunity to, to be an ambassador for Northern Ireland. And that is something going forward that we need to make sure that we don't lose. That ability for our music and for our spoken word and for our arts to represent us on a larger scale. Um, I think it's been very disappointing over the last few months. I find it very confusing, like many people in, in my sector, how whenever restaurants and pubs opened up, when they did open up, and people were allowed to socially distance, distance and sit beside total strangers, that wasn't applied to concerts and to theatres. I still can't get my head around that, especially whenever it was then shown that singing was no more dangerous than speaking at the same volume. Um, I'm hoping if we do end up in a situation that that can be addressed in a different way than it was. It was quite disappointing to think of that. I know my time's short, so I've skipped over a few things, um, but I do want to come to this last point. It's about education. Um, it's about the fact I, as I say, I'm the Artistic Director of the Performing Arts School, the BSPA, the Belfast Performing Arts School. And this period has been hugely difficult, it's been hugely difficult for for people in my sector, both the kids and the teachers. Um, many teachers have been utterly confused about what they can do and what they can't do. Teachers are wanting to earn a living, but at the same time, they also don't want to break rules and do something which gets them into trouble. It appears that in certain schools have approached councils or others for advice. That advice falls, well, it falls either in deaf ears or people who come back with extreme caution. That extreme caution partly is because they are understandably not wanting to stick their necks out and take a risk themselves because there's a lack of detail. Looking at the UK government website, details there are clearer. They are laid out to help teachers and the arts know what steps they can take. Here, unfortunately, 
that is not the case at the moment. So as a result, classes are cancelled, no matter the size of the class or safety or suitability of them. And it is to the detriment, not just the livelihoods of the teachers, but also to the mental well-being of the students. You know, it's hard to describe the satisfaction and joy and pleasure young people get from performing. I know it's not every child's cup of tea, but for those who enjoy it, it is something special. For many young people, performing is the one place they feel they belong. Some even feel they don't fit in anywhere else in the way they do at their performing arts school. And in turn, I believe the benefits they get through a performing arts school are every bit as important as the benefits they get whenever they're sitting in their maths class, their English class, or indeed their chemistry class. Let me be clear. The vast majority of those who go to performing school will not go on to do this as a profession. But the benefit to their confidence, understanding and acceptance of others, and ability to communicate in later life is immeasurable. I'm sure people like you in particular, whose career is by communication, understand this. I ask that this be considered and championed when future lockdown measures are being proposed. I've spoken to many young people and many pupils in my school, and they are struggling mentally with the uncertainty, the lack of routine, the inability to do what they enjoy most. At BSPA, like many other performing arts schools, we have put on some lessons in Zoom, like some entertainment has. These have worked to a certain extent, but they are no way, no way do they replace that actual thing about being in a room with other people and communicating and sharing that experience with them. I'm concerned that we are at a point where pupils are starting to disengage due to the lack of physical, physical classes. Also, parents are also concerned about the amount of time their children are spending in front of the screen. What is the reasoning that performing arts schools can't be considered within the school education category and be allowed to function, albeit under reduced capacity, in the way that schools can? Can I thank you for listening to this? I finish by saying that we're all in this together. We all want to find a way through it. Going forward, we need to support to find imaginative ways to open up performance, as well as events, which I haven't even had the chance to talk about and as well as teaching and entertain, entertainment in a safe way. That way people like me can get back to putting people like me can get back to putting smiles on people's faces. That's what we really should do. Okay, thank you, Peter, um, for your um, session today. I, I think it's very timely that we have you in, in front of us mm -hmm. at the moment. Um, we've heard from many organisations over the past few months that represent various bodies, various artists. Um, we've had the Ulster Orchestra and we've had various people have been in, but we haven't really heard that voice from individuals. Um, so it is, it is good to have you here. And we know not, it's not only you as an individual, but it's also you as, your, as a company as well. And you'd said there in your submission um, that you're, you're not one that goes running to the Arts Council for funding anyway, because you, you're a company and you rely on ticket sales and various things like that. So it's just to ask you then from your personal experience, and I know that there have been a lot of things have happened during lockdown where, um, ha, where, which has been devastating for you. Uh, and your company and your, your industry in general, but just what has been your experience over the, this period and this period of funding that has been made available for you and for your company? Um, uh, just how, how easy has that been or how difficult has that been? Um, how timely has it been? Uh, and just generally an overview of that would be good. Okay, well, from, from I mean, as you say, we're not used to, to going looking for funding, so it's a new experience for us, for my company and for me as an, as an individual. I, listening to what was being said before I actually started speaking earlier, I do think it was acknowledged that the Arts Council were, it was like a tsunami, I'm guessing, coming over them at the start of this. And I think that was reflected in how the money was and the grants were first uh, put out. I think that has improved. That is from my own personal experience, I would say it's improved. But I do know also that some people have fallen between the cracks. I know of situations where people applied for for money and maybe they didn't attach referees or maybe whatever they put through in, the, in their application didn't attach when it should have. And instead of them being told, by the way, just to let you know your application's come through, but you know this bit's missing, uh, they didn't hear anything for weeks. And then weeks later, they were just told that unfortunately, they have not been able to be put forward because this wasn't included in the application. I think things like that are disappointing. Um, so that's one thing I think that that could be looked at. Uh, 
Personally, I feel it has got better. Uh, of course, nobody wants to be coming looking for money. I would, there's nothing more I would rather do than be out earning my living and doing what I love doing. Um, but it's where we are at the moment. And I suppose that, I mean, that is a good thing about your industry. It's almost like a band of brothers where there, there is that camaraderie, there is that where you do talk to each other and you do find out. Um, so I, I suppose that, that's helpful for people going forward. Um, I'm sorry, could I, could I, one thing I didn't say, could I just bring into that that the company has had no, uh, no support. Yeah. Peter Corey Productions really hasn't, it's just me as an individual. And my wife, who works in the company, is an individual of financial support. Okay, you didn't apply then under the organisational um, We don't, funding? we work from home, okay. so I'm not even sure if we're not. Okay, all right, okay. No, thanks for that. Thanks for, for being honest there as well, Peter. Um, I'm going to open up to members. I've got Robin and then I've got Kelly as wanting to ask a few questions. Robin? Uh, thank you, Chair. Welcome, uh, Peter Curry, to the meeting. Thank him. Uh, it's a, as you say, Chair, it's a slightly different take on, on, on the situation that we're in. I also have to say I've been in the audience on a number of occasions when he's been performing and uh, enjoyed it immensely. I've also been in the audience when he has not been paid for his performance when he has been raising funds for charitable purposes uh, and that's very commendable. I'd like to just take you in a slightly different direction rather than Peter Corey uh, the the, uh, the company. You, you are, within your submission, you've indicated that you're the artistic director of the largest performing art school in Northern Ireland, the Belfast School of Performing Arts. Uh, I don't think, Chair, I mean, you can tell me if I'm wrong here, I don't think we have received a, 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 a submission mm -hmm. from the... Uh, I think so. Just... Maybe, Peter, in your role as the artistic director, and I'm going to say, I think the, the, the committee would welcome a presentation also from the Belfast School of Performing Arts. Particularly, you know, and you would placed a great deal of emphasis on the 600 pupils and the, the, the you know, the, what it does for their um, uh, self-confidence and indeed the, the knocks that it might, they have, will have taken over the period of this pandemic and perhaps to try and understand how the Belfast School of Performing Arts might want to go forward into the future. Um, mm. I think the committee... Will... Well, thank you very much, Robin. Um, and uh, it's a fair point. BSPA, as it's known, isn't the only performing arts school, but obviously I'm speaking from, from the point of view of it. Uh, we have eight schools throughout Northern Ireland uh, with age range from, well, there's the youngest, the, the, well, there's, there's a young preschool which is like from three years up, seven up to 18. And uh, as I say, we have over 600 pupils throughout those eight schools who on a Saturday come in to work on their dance, their singing and their acting. But as I, as I touched on earlier, the, the other point, how this I think is immeasurable for a young person's confidence their self-belief, their communication skills is immeasurable. And uh, it's been very difficult. We, we, we did, uh, during the summer, I, we were able to put on an outdoor sort of summer course to a certain extent. It's not the same, but even when the young people came into that, I could tell they were just, they were, they were, they were so, not just deflated, but, but just disappointed and not sure where they were. Their confidence had been knocked when I was speaking to them. I could see it. That, that brightness in the eyes had gone and, and I think that that has been seen through our performing arts schools all over the place and the difficulty BSPA has had like others is that it's just not clear enough what you can do and what you can't. Certainly BSPA, I don't think uh, BSPA is owned by a lady called Tina McVeigh and I've spoken to Tina on many occasions and she's tried to look for some sort of support she can get and some grants that she will be eligible for and none have quite fitted the bill from what she has been told. She sent that through to you know her financial advisor who said, unfortunately, there's nothing here that you can really go forward for. So from the point of view of going forward, we opened for one week. The kids came back for one Saturday two weeks ago, and now they're back on Zoom classes last Saturday and this Saturday. We are, we are hoping, as with everybody else, of course, that, that when we get to the two weeks before Christmas, that those two Saturdays where they will be able to go back. Um, we each school puts on its own production in a year puts on its own musical among other things and unfortunately all those musicals had to be 
set aside this year that have been rehearsing for them and working for them. And uh, I'm at a point where I've got to decide whether we can work again for them going forward for May or June or whether that's not going to be possible. Because like every other performance, you cannot just put it on when you get acknowledgement a week before, right, things are clear, you can put it on next week. That's not the way it can work. We have to work towards towards it, towards doing it for months in advance. We have also to look at the possibility of the staff being cut because unfortunately there just isn't enough kids uh, engaging in the Zoom as we would like. And at the moment, BSPA is, is not financially making sense because of the lack of numbers. And we understand that kids don't want to necessarily sit in the Zoom class or do a dance class in the middle of the front room rather than doing it with other, other children. So we're in a position where I, I hope I'm not speaking out of turn when I say the BSPA isn't in the same financial strong position that maybe it was a year ago because of that. So that has a knock-on effect to all our dance teachers, our singing teachers, and our drama teachers. Okay. Can I just uh, raise very quickly the idea that you had on the Titanic quarter, the drive-in. I have to say there was some media coverage of it. it seemed to me to be a, a good idea. Couldn't understand why it wouldn't be safe. I suppose it was uh, encouraging to, to, in the midst of where we were uh, to hear those words. I'm, I'm absolutely certain it would have lifted the spirits of folk. Uh, it, maybe through you, Chair, maybe we could try to understand from the two organisations that Peter had uh, approached and, and why there wasn't a, a definitive answer or a definitive um, reasons why, why such a, an uplifting uh, situation uh, couldn't couldn't go forward. So, no, absolutely. I, I hope can. hope you might find that helpful. Yeah, we can we can write as a committee and ask and, and ask the reasons behind that. That's not a problem. Um, so it is. Yeah, yeah, that was disappointing because I mean uh, we did get sort of verbal positive acceptance to the idea and people saying yeah they, they were keen on on coming on board and helping us. It's just because of the model of a drive-in concert, you cannot physically get enough people in to. Make, to financially make sense and putting up a stage outdoors for one concert is just as expensive as putting it up for seven or eight concerts so so we, we were left in, in that position that's the same pretty much with performances of anything both in a theater and in a car park or in, a, in Bell Sonic or whatever the, the the initial cost of putting up the stage the sound the lights is huge uh, and if you're doing it for five concerts or ten concerts it makes more financial sense than doing it for one I don't know why in the end we didn't get the support. I thought it would have been a great thing for Belfast. Um, also, I then approached uh, the executive about, unfortunately, the other thing, apart from the money going, we did go ahead. We had to increase the ticket price. We did put it on sale without this financial support. And we had to increase the ticket price, which is something we didn't want to do. And then it was announced that restaurants and pubs and uh, were opening on the exact same date, which was a terrific thing. I mean, nobody, nobody wants to say that wasn't good uh, at the start of July, but it, it left me in the weird position that I was putting on a concert in a car park where people had to sit in their car. I asked the assembly to look at the executive to look at possibly letting the audience sit outside the car and in social distance from other people. So out in the fresh air, and that wasn't approved. So the the what was selling very well as a concert suddenly stopped selling tickets because it suddenly fell out of date. And why would you want to sit in the concert? Would you go to a restaurant and sit beside other people? Things like that. So it was very disappointing, and timing was unlucky. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Robin. Kelly, can I ask you to be as quick as you can as well? I, I will be, Peter. Thank you very much. Um, I'll not go over what Robin has already asked you. Um, it's very difficult for people who entertain us to keep doing that when the, the heart has been knocked out of you so often. But I'm thinking about the future, about the school, about your business and about other performers. You will have heard earlier today us talking to the department about a strategy for moving forward. I think that your voice and others belong to the school and industry like yourself would be a vital component of designing that strategy because if we're faced with something like this in the future, it's mm. only through your evidence that we can grow and protect, as you say. Why not have an outdoor concert at Titanic? What has been the impact to those young people? Have we lost a generation of performers? Is that something that you could or would want to be involved in? Absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, I feel it's my obligation, my position. Um, 
look, I'm lucky that, that financially I can I can manage through through this situation, but there's others who maybe can't in the same way. And certainly where the young people are concerned, I think I would be very happy to, to be involved in a conversation going forward. Yeah, absolutely. It's just when we know how many people are involved in productions, it's not just the person at the microphone, it's all the, the names that you see at the end of the film screen, you know, and it's all those names. <laughs> what are those things? But um, yeah, no, I think that the industry has has probably struggled the worst and the in and out of, of restrictions gave heart and took it away. Um, and I'm sorry for that. But Yes, no, you're right, Kelly. And we've been constantly, it's been like trying to reinvent the wheel. We've been trying to find ways to, to imaginative ways to make things work. Um, funny, I was up visiting a family uh, a few weeks ago when we were allowed to, and uh, it suddenly hit me that, that some people haven't been affected financially by the situation. And it was just like a, a, a light bulb moment when I was thinking, God, in my industry, that we are just on our knees and um, and other people, it just hasn't affected at all. And uh, it's nice that a, it's important that a light's being shone on it. As I say, we've been trying to reinvent the wheel. We've been looking at Peter Kerr Productions in a way that like we are providing, uh, we went to several people with an idea of entertainment and shop windows. Uh, and that was accepted by the Ards and North Member Council. And, and that was happening before the lockdown for a couple of weeks and fingers crossed will happen if things open up a bit before Christmas, um, things like that. Uh, and uh, going forward, we need to be imaginative. Maybe maybe we need to look at some sort of outdoor space being provided by the uh, public sector, somewhere where we know that an audience will be confident, because that's the other thing that we need to think about here, is the confidence of an audience coming back. It's all very well being able to put something on, but, you know, I know that certain people that I know would, would be reluctant, much as they love live performance, would be reluctant to go to it. So we have to do all we can to reassure that, that what we do is, is safe and, and acceptable to, to an audience. Uh, but certainly if there was that idea of financially supporting something in somewhere like Ormo Park or something which had a theatre but had fresh air blowing through it, maybe, that, maybe that's something that would help us in the short term uh, as as I hope it would only be the short term because we can get back to a position where people will be confident to go back into theatres and the concert. And looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Peter. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Kelly. Um, so, Peter, um, thank you for coming in and briefing us today. I think it, what Robin has suggested too was a good idea that you maybe send a submission in to the committee with reference to the school and the effect that that has had on the school. We will then forward that through to the department and also any of your thinking around the strategy going forward, any, anything that you would write to us, we will certainly pass that on to the department as well. Um, and I absolutely look forward. I have been to see many of your productions in the theatre at the mill. I've also been to outdoor productions that, we've, that have been run through Newton Abbey Council as well. And they are doable. They are very doable and very safe. Um, uh, albeit we haven't done them during COVID, but um, I have I've, I've availed flow. So can I thank you, Peter? Um, I thank you for waiting on us and having to endure um, a, a, lot, a lot of questioning from the committee. But thank you. Okay, Peter? Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, members, I'm going to move swiftly on. I'm taking agenda item 9 and 10 off our order paper. We will look at those next week. And can I ask you to go straight to agenda item 11, which is correspondence, and bear with me because I'm just going to do a very, very quick read. Um, can I just first of all draw your attention to department table paper on the Sports Sustainability Fund, the fund launched this week, um, commencing the 30th of November, and will be administered by, through Sport NI. Can I then draw your attention then to the letter from um, the Chief Executive of CCNI um, around the issues that were brought up last week? Um, yeah. I just want to just say about that, about this section one. Uh, well, isn't it 167, yeah. section 167, 167 which has not yet commenced and has been there since 2008. I know we have asked the Minister to come in and brief us um, now on many occasions to do with the Charities Commission. This is be a different briefing. If we could ask that the Department come and brief us as to what the reason is why this has not been, has not been enacted, um, and uh, would members be in agreement with that, that we ask them to come in and do that with us? Great. Yes. Yeah. Because it's going to cause charities dreadful handling if we don't get that done. I worked for a 167 charity. I actually don't think that that explains 
all of the people who are on the list. Okay. Yeah. So, but it well, would be good. To will, find out. That's good. Then, we, if we get them in, then we can ask those questions. I'm sorry, I'm rushing members here <laughs> because I'm quite conscious we've got like one minute left. Um, <laughs> So our members happy enough with that, and then just again, I uh, just your attention to the with the letter that we got from the secretary of the Down Masonic Widows Fund. Again, they're another charity um, with the same problem of, that the Stroke Association and the Children's Heartbeat Trust had uh, regarding reserves. Our members happy enough that we forward that to the department as well. Yeah, yep. Okay, and then just draw your attention to the memo um, from the Committee for Criminal Justice on the Criminal Justice Committal Reform Bill. Um, just to ask members if they want to make a response or they do they want to bring this back for further discussion at a future meeting before <coughs> making that response. So we'll bring it back. Yeah, yeah. Right. okay. And then can I draw a members' attention to table paper regarding the COVID regulations in relation to youth sport? Again, can I, would the members agree if I forward that on um, the correspondent on to the executive for comment? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Then I'm just going to ask: Did members very, very quickly have anything they want to bring up other than that under correspondence? No. No, nope, we're all good. Okay. I then want to move on quickly then to agenda item 12, which is forward work program. Inform members that our meeting next week, the 10th of December, um, will have the department on three matters: proposals for gambling bill, on its five-year strategy, and on the labour market interventions. We also hope to hear from National Museums Northern Ireland and the Model Engineers Society. And then we're also Colin Pigeon from Assembly Research, and he's going to give us a presentation on the Northern Ireland Public Finance Framework, the budget rules, and the scope for committee and assembly involvement in the budget process, um, 21 to 22. Members happy enough with that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then I'm going to move on then to AOB and agenda item 13. Any other business members need to bring up at this time? Alex, hurry up. Chair, can we maybe find out when they're going to release the next batch of charity funding for people to apply? Because I haven't heard of them yet. Yeah, that was due to be, the, the pre-application was due to yeah. come out on December the 6th, was it? 6th or 7th. From I remember from last week's brief when we had this. Okay. And then the charity fund was due to open in January, but we'll get those specific dates sent okay. through. That's fine. Anybody else under AOB? No? Do you? <laughs> you all right? Do you, do you, I don't mind. If you want to go ahead, Andy, go ahead. No, it's okay. I'll let's. Okay, all right. Um, then can I just move on to agenda item 14, which is very, a very important date, time and location of next meeting. Our next meeting will take place here um, next Thursday in room 29 at 9 a.m. So remember, members, early start next week. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Committee Room 29.